Stimulating late night sports conversation for people who know that just trying to find someone sober to talk to at this time of night is like trying to find a pig on the moon. In the early morning, No rules news debate from around the world and around the bend. Uh, the two mics. Fly more lager. On Talk Sport. Yeah. In Birmingham, that means per 100 people, 58 people a day eat a tin of uh, canned food. So 58% of the, of the population of Birmingham basically eat a tin of canned food every day? No, 58 per 100. Well, that's 58%. That's 58%, that's right. That's what I just 58% said. 58% of people <laughs> in Birmingham, yeah, uh, uh, eat uh, a tin of food. <laughs> well, I don't know, what are you laughing <laughs> Polar bears regard a human arm as, like, a spare rib, you know, from a Chinese restaurant, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And they just, like, sit there chewing on it, you know what I mean? Think about a kangaroo in an egg and spoon race. What? Ooh, hoo, 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 hoo. <laughs> that means, in given language, move away from any low slung branch as there's likely to be a snake lurking there. This is Talk Sport. We are the two mics. Welcome uh, to another edition of uh, what can only be described as uh, the magic and mayhem uh, of football, plus an awful lot of other things. Uh, Mr. Parry is here with me. Time to say a very good morning to him. Very good morning to you, Mr. Parry. Yeah, good morning, Mike. And before we go any further, I just want to make it absolutely clear to everybody, yes. to everybody concerned, uh-huh. that the unfortunate tackle that broke the leg of Luke Shaw, yeah. um, a, a massively uh, talented and fantastic prospect for England's future, yeah. the tackle was not an illegal tackle. Uh-huh. I have to say that... I think uh, it was just very unfortunate for him. What was the name of the boy him. who went in again, jumped in on him? It was Hector Moreno. Hector Moreno, who scored the equalising goal he did. Uh, later on in the game. I think he went in with good intent to try and both block... I mean, it was a very strong his, tackle. Well, well, to both block his move and go for the ball. Yeah. At no, um, at no stage within that encounter between the two men did Moreno's bo- uh, boot or foot or leg touch the, the damaged limb. The, um, well, the it's right interesting le- you say that. Right have, a listen, have a listen to this from Rick yeah. in London, who's texted in <coughs> already yeah. to 81089. It is imperative you mm. wait take retrospective action against Hector Moreno after his horror show tackle on Luke Shaw. No, I don't if think you wait for, Hang on. If you wait for want to preserve the integrity and reputation of the Champions League, wild tackles like that have no place in football, mindless violence and physical assault. Well, I'm sorry, but I disagree with all of that. If you look at it, it, it wasn't a wild tackle, to be honest. He was actually trying to block the well, progress I mean, of the ball. Well, it was a two-footed tackle for a start. No, it wasn't. It was a two-footed tackle. No, it wasn't. Tackle. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was a two-footed tackle. No, 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 tackle. two-footed tackle means both the feet are off at the same time heading towards the player. It was player. two they feet didn't. coming towards no. Luke Shaw. No, 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 Moreno's right uh, leg mm. was used as a, like a blocking barrier uh, in front of the ball to stop the progress of the ball with Luke Shaw behind it. And Moreno's left leg caught um, Luke Shaw's right leg. Yeah. And, and, and because the right leg was planted to the floor, that caused the double right. fracture. But that's why it was a two-footed tackle. It was a two-footed tackle. He was tackle. tackling with his right foot, mm. but his left foot actually caught Moreno, so therefore it was a two-footed tackle. No, it wasn't, honestly, Mike. It, 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 it was a two-footed tackle means both your feet are off the ground at the same time, and they weren't, and that you are heading with intent with your studs showing towards the opposition player, and that didn't happen. There, were, there, there weren't Listen, any I'm not, I'm not saying that he, was, he, he, was, he had violent intent. Yeah. I'm saying that it was a very, very uh, strong tackle. It was a very um, strong tackle. I've watched it a few times, and, you know, I don't think he intended, of course, to, to, to injure the player. He doesn't look as if he's anything other than shell-shocked mm. at the result of it, right? Mm. Louis van Gaal says it should have been a red card, but he says himself, yeah. well, if I complain about a red card and yeah. a penalty, yeah. people will say I'm just moaning because we lost the game. Yes. I mean, I think it's one of those that people will debate for a very, very long time. It's terrible yeah. news for, for Luke Shaw, oh, it's terrible. who was just seeming news. to hit a kind of... Uh, Seeming yeah. to, to, to hit a groove, really, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah. Um, and he's running at pace into the penalty area. I'm just watching it again yes. here. Um, and the guy stops the ball. Yes. Uh, and he goes over. It's, yeah, well, it's that's, as simple as that. That's exactly what I said. He's, the, the Moreno was blocking the ball. He wasn't so much blocking the player. He decided that the ball was had a traje- trajectory towards the goal, and, mm. he, and he decided to stop it. I mean, the thing is, Mike, you're getting sucked into this European argument again. I'm not getting sucked yes, in. Yes, you are. Because yes, you, you haven't are. actually asked me whether I agree with you. Well, well yes, but you, you're kind of half agree and half not agree. What you, I'm, what you're I'm reading saying, out other people's opinions no. without giving me your own. Well, you haven't asked me for mine. I don't, uh, you should have offered your opinion already. Well, well I, I, say well, I was offering thing. you Rick's opinion because Rick is a valued well, listener and he's already well, texted well, in. Well, I think the listeners the out there, well, thank you very much indeed, Rick, for your opinion. But I think the listeners out there prefer your opinion to old well, Rick. You know, are you saying my opinion is more important than Rick's? Is and the, and my opinion is no more important. My opinion, he's making to the show. My opinion is no more important than Rick's. Well, that's, to be honest. that's absolutely true. Actually, yeah. that is absolutely true. In fact, and neither your is opinions, yours. And neither is yours. Mine's much more important. Oh, really? Yeah. That's what you think. Oh no, no, I know. Yeah. I know. You're such an expert. The reason people stay up to this time of night. 
right is to get the verdict, right, the mm. verdict yeah. from those who have been watching assiduously... Assiduously? On, ..on the tackle. How do you do that? On the tackle, How OK? How have been watching assiduously? On the tackle. Okay. Now, if you want to offer your opinion, then please do. Well, allow me to uh, offer you my opinion, then. Yeah, I on. think, it, as I said, it was a very strong tackle. I said that right from the start. You keep I saying that! I don't Are think you the a parrot? Well, you said you didn't hear my opinion, so I obviously didn't hear it the first time. I I'll say it to you again. I heard you say it four times. I don't think there was any intent to, 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 to injure the I've player. i heard you say that four times. OK, so you've heard my opinion. Uh, my, his, I believe his intent was to... But you to, said you to, hadn't given your opinion. I, well, I said you haven't let me finish my opinion. Oh, you well, haven't let me it. elaborate on, on it. it. Uh, I don't think there was any intent to do anything other than to stop a goal-scoring opportunity. So that's three positives However, so far. However, I think he should have been yellow-carded. For what? For that tackle. Why? Because I believe it was a two-footed it tackle. It wasn't a two-footed tackle. I've just told Even you. Even though that. he hit the ball. I've Even though he got the that. ball, it was a two-footed tackle. I've just told you. I've just scientifically explained why it wasn't a two-footed tackle. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why I bother. So now we have got your opinion. Your yes. opinion is that it was a great tackle, it was a strong tackle, it was yeah. an effective tackle, but it was a yellow card. But it should have been a yellow well, card. how contradictory is that? Well, the world you of don't ca- know the your world, own mind, that's world, your problem. The world of football is, 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 a, is, a, is a contradictory didn't world. Didn't even bother giving it a funeral, that's your problem. You've got a very confused You think I should have had a funeral mind. for a goldfish? Well, I think you should have done something. Your poor child was heartbroken to find the... Um, it was not heartbroken. The, the, the goldfish face no. down in, in the goldfish bowl. You no. should have done something more about it. Gold, but we're not no, talking about the goldfish. The world of goldfish and children is all about teaching children about death it's not about you know having funerals and having Teaching you know some children ridiculous, about yeah. death. i know you know nothing about children so we can go into that well, area you know nothing bit. about death I don't know much about death. I've no, stared I haven't death died. in the face, mate. Laughed, <laughs> spat in the face of death, and come back. My belief so about that. you know that, nothing about death. My belief about that is the Grim Reaper turned up and thought, you know, this bloke is such a nuisance and a pain in the neck that actually I don't want to take him with me. I think I'll just leave him where he is. N- nice to have your sympathetic view on, <laughs> on a, you know, on a colleague who was given thirty-six hours to live. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, well, thirty. That's not what you say. Thirty-six hours to what, live. What do you mean I say? You think I made that up? Yeah, I do actually. <laughs> what do you think I made Let's that up? Let's talk to the Incredible why, Hulk, Doctor Banner. Why, why can't we get Doctor Banner on the on the show? Why would I Why make we up? Get him on? Why would I make up such a shocking statistic? Well, because it sounds good. It would, no, it'd be cruel because other people in Harefield Hospital who I was with in those days are yeah. no longer around. You can't possibly oh, trade on oh, the oh, how, how on bizarre. the emotion. Oh, what the, a coincidence! So, what? Well, all the people uh, who told you you only had thirty six hours to live have all died, have they? No. Or was no, it like no, the no. curse of Toot and Carmen? No, no, no. Some of them the lived Porky for months. Curse. Lived for months, and then all of a sudden, you know. Well, how many witnesses shot. were in the room when they told you you had thirty six hours to live? About five. And where are they? Well, they're all top doctors. Well, let's they're, get one of them on. They were all sitting around the bedside. I, you know, it's just a miracle. Telling me if I didn't get a heart transplant, it was kaput, you know what no, I mean? No, I mean, not only is it a miracle that you're still here, but it's a miracle that due to your, you know, yes. reasonably kind of, shall we say, loose lifestyle, yes. that you don't appear to be doing any more damage to the organ. No, well, that's because I lead a very good lifestyle. Now, we're not talking about my lifestyle. We're talking about football tonight. What a disastrous start to the Champions League campaign for English teams. I know. I mean, I am talking about disastrous. He's right, absolutely right, because yesterday, yeah. only yesterday, Mm. You know, PSV Eindhoven, we were told, have had their best player Weak. taken away. Memphis Depay, yeah. uh, who was the first goal scorer for Manchester United, exactly. right? You know, he scored more goals for them last season than any other player. Their he other did. second best player was taken to go and play for Newcastle. Right. So um, United was supposed to win this one, hands yep. down. Yep. Manchester City, meanwhile, were playing a Juventus team that have only got one point, one point out of three games of three in the uh, Serie A. Uh, yeah. And yet they went 1-0 up and also lost 2-1. So yeah. you have to ask the question, do you not? Uh, first of all, is Lou Van Hal correct to say that United aren't ready? For the premier, for sort of the premier elite level of European football, and is Manuel Pellegrini mm. just going to have mm. yet another season of mediocrity in Europe? I don't know. I mean, the Pellegrini one is the most interesting because they've made such an impressive start to the Premier League, yeah. and we have to, you know, some people try to, you know, snipe away and say, well, the Premier League isn't the strongest league in Europe. It is in terms of the number of strong teams we've got. Well, I don't think it is actually. No, it, no, it is. As has now just been proven. I mean, we're supposedly told the Dutch yeah. league mm. is of no use whatsoever. Uh, Syria yeah, supposedly true. is nowhere near as good as it's meant. Uh, you to be so, I mean, supposedly and Manchester City are, are, are would be considered to be the best well, team in Europe. At the I moment. think they fouled up something rotten tonight, City, because they they, uh, they had a one goal lead, didn't they? They and did, then, and lost at home. As did, as did United to an average team, as did United. Yeah, so pretty damn. Uh, Pretty damn uh, miserable night, and 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 actually, what I didn't realise, of course, until I um, studied the old um, fixtures, oh, yeah. is it was Manchester last night, and it's London tonight, isn't it? It's Arsenal so, and Chelsea. So, yeah. so it's a, battle, it's a battle of the uh, the battle of the two. Dynamo Zagreb against Arsenal uh, yeah. live on Talksport, yeah. and Chelsea at home to um, uh, Maccabee Tel Aviv. That's right. I mean, and surely with, they won't lose that game. Well, with Chelsea in their current sort of um, confused mentality hmm. situation, you see old Jose again today. 
day. Mm. One minute having a joke about his haircut, and the next minute taking out a reporter who actually... Who asked him a stupid question. I totally agree. On, on this occasion with Jose, the, the reporter said to him, why do you always fail in your third season? Yeah. And Jose then produced all the statistics mm. to show that he doesn't fail he in his third season. He didn't have a third season at Inter Milan. He didn't have a third season at Porto or uh, Inter Milan. Uh, right, and he had a, th- <laughs> he had a third season at Chelsea last time, yeah. and he won a load of stuff. Yeah, and when he pointed out that I don't have a fairly third season, the boy wouldn't let it go. So, in the end, I think Jose was right there. Yeah, but I think that's he the, was. That's the difficulty of taking on a man who is clearly a footballing genius. If you don't get your facts well, absolutely right, let this be a warning yeah. to you, Mr Gray. Yeah. Don't get your facts absolutely right. Mm. You'll be found out to be a fool. Would you like to hear the result of winners and losers? Not really. OK, we'll bring it up to you next on Talk Sport. Tricks his way through and scores on his return to Eindhoven. Memphis inside the penalty area. Turn one defender, slots it into the bottom right-hand corner. Manchester United have spent the money on prodigious young talent and that young talent is stepping up to the plate. PSV nil, Manchester United won. Leicester end to take this corner and outswing it towards the edge of the six yard box and it's in. Might go down as an on goal but it was Moreno with the header for PSV. Took a touch on the United player on the way through. The first set piece they've had to defend, an inability to defend it, United to Achilles heel, and PSV are back on level terms in first half stoppage time. Ball headed away through the midfield, flicked on by Damian, and then they've got past Damian into Lestien. Lestien left hand side of the end, got falling from here, and the header is into the net from Narsing. United, caught napping, a square back line, Damian beaten, Lestien's ball in, and quality written all over it. Such an inviting one for Narsing, who's got his head to it. United, the better side, but find themselves behind. And that is all down to Damian. De Gea whacks it forward, one in the back by Hendricks, and that will be it. Not a happy return for Manchester United. PSV 2, Manchester United 1. Not a good night for Mancunian football. Yeah, not a good night for Mancunian football. I think it's a bit over the top to be playing the death march. I don't think it's the death of Mancunian no, football I by think... any means, or indeed the death of English football no, in Europe. No, it's not. So, I, I mean, mean I don't only, know whoever chose that um, piece of music should be well, taken out and flogged. Well, That's I, what I say. I think we just have to ignore that. Nothing we can do about there that. There isn't but, anything. Uh, We're going to go to the phones in a moment, yeah. so we want to hear from you out there. 08717 Problem is, of course, uh, that when you look around the, uh, uh, the Champions League last night, mm. as I'm sure you have, Mr Parry, yeah. and you see some of the other results, Real Madrid 4, Shakhtar Donetsk 0, mm. Paris Saint-Germain 2, Malmo 0, uh, we've got Benfica 2, Astana 0, mm. we've got Atletico Madrid 2, Galatasaray 0, everybody else in Sevilla, uh, who are in Manchester City's group, 3-0 against Borussia Mönchengladbach. Yeah. I mean, everybody else who was expected to win won, yeah, exactly, apart from the two yeah. Manchester yeah, clubs. I know. It's, uh, it's not good. It's, it's very depressing, actually, because it's not so many years ago when we had three out of four uh, of the teams in the semi-finals were English yeah. teams. We had two teams in the final in Moscow, and we regularly had a, um, uh, an English club, at least in the semi-finals, and in the final, you know, yeah. in the Arsenal in France, uh, uh, United and uh, Chelsea in Moscow, yeah. uh, Manchester United in Rome, and then at Wembley, and, uh, and that's all gone. Um, we can't expect uh, those sort of things anymore. And that is very depressing, in my view. Well, why should we expect them anymore? I mean, we spend the most money in the Premier League yep. for players and we, we, for wages. We spend the most money on yes. TV rights. You know, yes. it's supposed to be the most, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, I don't know, entertaining league yes. in the world. Yes. We have this conversation every year, but I don't see why we should now expect well, it to be the norm. I think because we've lost our grip on going forward. I, uh, when I mean going forward, I mean progressing the sort of football we play. And I don't know why, because as we've got most money in the world and we can attract the best players, the best players still don't come here, do they? Well, R- Ronaldo there's and Messi not many, don't play there's not in this many country. of the best players that don't come no. here. Well, well, you tell me the best players in the world who play in the Premier League. Well, Sergio Aguero, probably one of the, one of the best I, strikers in the world. I would say Aguero world. is definitely within that league, but I think he's the only one, isn't you he? You think he's the only one? Yeah, I think Eden so. Eden Hazard, would you not class him as one of the best players in the world? I would. Well, his form at the moment isn't terribly good, is it? But, I mean, Thomas Muller didn't want to come here. Thibaut Courtois, I think you'd have to say he's may- one of the best maybe, goalkeepers in the may- world. May- David De Gea. Yeah, yeah, but, he, but he's not in the world. Well, there's four yeah. straight away. Well, no, I don't think so. I, I well, think... you've just agreed with me. No, no, I haven't agreed with you. I haven't agreed with you. Right, I'll mean, tell you what, let's talk to Why Declan. did Ronaldo, who is the best player in the world, decide to leave the Premier League because, and go elsewhere? Because culturally, he preferred to be in Madrid. Yeah, well, Do you know you how know. many goals he scored in the last two games, by the way? He scored five in his last game. Yeah. He scored... He scored two scored last two, night, That's right, yeah. Seven. Uh, I saw a very funny clip on YouTube of Thomas Muller talking about Muller. Uh-huh. Doing an impersonation of Ronaldo. Have you seen it? No. It is so funny. He... 
He, you know, um, you know, Ronaldo when he does his sort of tiptoe type, um, you know, his run. You know, he's, t- he's sort of tiptoe type playing with the ball, jumping yeah, yeah. over the ball and putting it behind step him and around him and all that. Yeah, all Muller that. did all that, but he was clearly taking a mickey out of Ronaldo. It's very funny. Why would he do that? Well, because I think that sure Ronaldo is interpreted it. No, Ronaldo is no within football in circles as having the biggest ego. So I think footballers well, being in the football yours. world. Don't be ridiculous. You can't be bigger than yours. Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> and I think um, I think that uh, Old Muller was taking the mission the way I, footballers I, do. I, I stand corrected. Ronaldo got another hat trick. So he scored, he eight, so he scored so eight, eight, eight goals. Yeah, but he hadn't scored in the seven goal games before that, had he? It doesn't matter. He, he went he's to just a, scored eight a, goals. I know, but amazingly, he went through a seven game drought of mm. not scoring anything. So he's just making up for that. But yeah. I mean, you know, there's no question. Anyway, stop rabbiting on. I want to get to the phone. Let's do Declan, that. It's a Spurs fan. He wants to say something about the Champions League. Declan, very good morning to you. Morning, lads. What, yeah, would you like to, what would you like to say, Declan? Is it too oh, early? Yeah. Is it too early to say the death of uh, English football in Europe? Oh, the, uh, it's dead. It's gone. Forget it. They're absolutely rubbish. They don't even have enough English players between them. Uh, they, they don't. They, there's, there's no heart. There's no. There's nothing. They're overpaid. A load of rubbish. Load of rubbish. That's a, that's a bit of a broad sweeping statement, Declan. Just because you know we're playing the death march there, and the, and the jury's out really on whether or not it was justified. To be perfectly honest, but but the fact that we lost two games in the opening night, it it, it doesn't in any way doesn't in any way represent how we're going to do in the tournament. It's a carbon copy of last season and and the season before and the season before. The, the the group stages are nearly the same. Mm. The, it's just a load of rubbish. Well, I tell you what, Mr Pellegrini at City has got to improve upon this dramatically, and that means he's got to get out of this group, if not win this group, from a very poor start. Otherwise, there's a big question mark over whether or not he'll still be well, in work by Christmas. Well, they, they won't win the group, will they? Because they're losing Seville. They, they, uh, it's undoubtedly... I think, I, think, I think Seville will beat them at home. Do you? Well, well, that's very a very bold possibly, statement. Yes. Yeah. Very possibly, it's a very bold yes. statement. Who is Seville? Very possibly. They won the Europa possibly. League. Yeah, OK, well, they... so what? But who are they in terms of the Champions League? Well, they're Seville's very... better known for growing oranges than football teams. Not true. They've won, <laughs> they've won, they've won, they've won, the, cha- they've won the Europa League twice, right? So? Um, two years in a row. So? It's and a now Mickey they're in Mouse competition. League. Well, you say that, but they're yeah. in the Champions League as a result of winning it. I Everton, know they Everton are. didn't get that far in it, did they? No, because we didn't want to. Oh, really? No, we were distracted sure? and, mm. and didn't want to. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Declan, I, I must yeah. apologise for my uh, part. That's all right, lads. No problem, I enjoy the battle. Let me let me but, ask you about the tackle on Luke Shaw. What did you think of it? Listen, lads, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. And um, from from what um, uh, one of the gentlemen are saying, it's look, it's un- it's unfortunate for the boy. It really, really, it really is. is. Yeah, it is terrible. Um, oh, well, terrible. listen, thanks for yeah. calling in, yeah. Declan. Here's a, a view from Phil in Exmouth, right. who has my view on this. Really, he right. says there was no intent. However, rule state challenges with excessive force are fouls, along with challenges that lack control, mm. which arguably it was both. It was. I feel bad force. for both players involved. Mm. Well, I, I think you could argue that both of those things would be true, that it was it was excessive force no, and, it and it was out of control. No, it wasn't. No, not in my view, it was mm. not. It was measured, I think. You see, this is the problem, Mike. You're getting sucked in now by the European argument. Take physical contact out well, of football. the rules are the rules. You are, honestly. No, your your head is being by turned by no, I'm, this all nonsensical I'm is, idea that physical contact in football is true. bad. Not true. Yes, it is. All I'm saying is, is if you have a rule, you might as well use it. If you, have, if you don't want to use a yeah. rule, then don't have it. Well, now, the rule is, is that if the tackle is out of control and the tackle is excessive force then it should be a yellow card. I think it was brilliant refereeing. I really do. Really? I thought the guy got it absolutely right, and, and I have to say that he struck a blow for the restoration and the the long-term um, capacity for physical contact in the game of football, which mm. we are rapidly losing. Yeah. Rapidly losing, and, and, and I dislike it enormously. It's terrible. Shoulder charges should be allowed these days. Talking about physical contact. Well, there's no point right. in going back to talk, the 1960s, talk, talk, is talking it? Talking about physical contact. Yeah, go on. Do you see that um, only this week the legendary cricketer Brian Close died? Yes. Right? Aged 84 years of age. Yes, there was a lot of obituaries in the papers yesterday. Obituaries yesterday. Did you see the pictures of him taking his shirt off after he'd faced up to the West Indies I did. when he was 45 yes. years of age? Yeah. It was like a man who'd been beaten senseless mm. by um, guys with baseball yeah. bats. Showing, he must be. 
his uh, wounds. Yes, he must be the bravest sportsman of well, all time. Well, he's been described as the, as the bravest cricketer it, of all time and, and, and the hardest cricketer of all time um, as well. Unbelievable. And, and, and when we look at the way footballers these days whinge and moan by the slightest passing contact with another uh, footballer, you think of that man, Brian Close, and you think there was an Englishman who could take pain. There was an Englishman who got stuck in. There was an Englishman who did not flinch in the face of physical yeah, force. Yeah, hang on, hang on. Let's not forget that there are players now who are suffering as bad, as many bad injuries as they did in the past. So if you say that physical force is being taken out of the game, mm. then how does that explain, for example, uh, the terrible situation now surrounding uh, uh, Jack Wilshire, uh, who now has to have some kind of operation. It could be out for weeks and weeks and weeks Jack and weeks. W- Jack Wilshire is not suffering a multiplicity of injuries from outrageous contact play with other footballers. A lot of Jack Wilshire's injuries, sadly, are occurring in very, very indiscriminate situations. Well, he's suffering from a hairline fracture in his left leg. And, you know, I, I, I saw one expert talking today saying that could be the effect of the fact that he's bandy-legged yeah. and that he runs on the outside of his feet. Term? What? A bandy leg. Is that a medical term you're using there? Yes, it is, yeah. Right. And and he runs on the outside of his feet, and mm. that could have led to, to the um, the hairline fracture because it was done in a, apparently in a non-contactable situation. Well, it was done in pre-season training. That's what I'm saying, a non-contact situation. So so we, we simply don't know what's going on there. But it is a mystery, isn't it? It's amazing, An absolute isn't it? mystery. Time? I mean, somebody was saying to, to me on Twitter, I can't believe this is the right amount of time, but is it possible he's, he's, been, he's been out of the game now totally for something like five years? He, he's, of all the games he could have played from Arsenal since he signed a contract at 17 mm. as, a, as a senior professional, he's missed more than 50% of the games yeah. or he's not been available for more than 50% of the games right. he could have played. It, it's, a, it's an astonishing statistic. And he's going to miss at least another three months of this season by the looks of it. Yeah. Now, all of this, uh, you know... What and I, when you think what of I the performance call... he put in for England, by the way, mm. those two goals he scored yeah. for England uh, in that away game, you know, you really worry about the quality of players that we're producing, and when we do, what happens to them like that? It's unbelievable. Now, do you want to hear the... uh, You're just filibustering, so you don't want Mm. to hear the result of winners and losers, because I have to tell you... Yes. um, um, I massacred you last week, of course. The margin of victory... Uh, is about 50% higher this week than it was last no, week. No, rubbish. Last week, you very nearly beat mm. me by 2-1, to one, That's not right. quite. That's right. This week, I've actually got practically three times as many votes as you. I don't you. believe that. Retweets for Mike Parry, 112. Mm-hmm. Favourites for me, mm-hmm. 297. No, there's something wrong that there. That is the biggest margin of victory ever in a winners and losers no, uh, uh, something, edition. I'm something wrong you. there. When I went there's home last wrong. night, it was even Stevens. No, it wasn't. It was You've never been even. working on this overnight Not or something. All. Yes, Why is it that when you win it, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's always fine? And when I win it, there's always been some kind of gerrymandering. Because Why is that? as Tony Blair... Because you're a sore loser, aren't you? As Tony Blair well, once admit said... you're a sore loser. As Tony Blair once said early on in his premiership, and we now all know this to be true, I'm a pretty straightforward sort of guy. <laughs> yeah, you've got a lot in common. This is Talk Sport. Sport. We are the two mics. There will be a podcast coming out a little bit later on. Let's ask Porky tonight as well. We've got loads of great questions. Mm-hmm. If you need to get one in, uh, some problem that you need solving, a business uh, decision you need helping with, uh, some personal stuff that you need sorting out, uh, he is the man. Uh, he's here to help, and you can tweet at the two mics, or you can call in if you want uh, and get your uh, your answer live on air. Uh, we're going to talk to Mark Donaldson in a moment about the misery uh, in Manchester tonight. Both teams losing in the first uh, group game of the Champions League, and some of the other stuff as well. Let me read you a few tweets first of all, Mr. Parry. Mm-hmm. Bill says, "Who are Seville?" Fountain of knowledge, Parry showing a typical arrogant Premier League attitude to European football. Uh, here's one from uh, no, I'm not. Uh, Dazza, who says, Porky the Plank is now comparing himself to that clown Blair. He should never get another vote on winners and losers. No, 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 I didn't. I was I was taking the mickey out of uh, the former Prime Minister because that's what politicians are here for. OK. We have to examine their behaviour at all times. Indeed. And James says, uh, I'm sorry, but for the first time ever, Porky is bang on the money tonight. Thank you. I don't know what he's been drinking. Thank you. Uh, let's talk to Mark Donaldson and find out what he made of the shows, uh, the, the games last night. Mark, a very good morning to you. Good morning, boys. How are you both? Yeah. Hi, Mark. Pretty very, good. Very, pretty, well pretty good indeed. shape, mate. Pretty bad start to the Champions League for uh, for the English teams. Both Manchester teams going at one goal up and then losing 2-1. Um, mm. Is it going to be the same as last year all over again? Well, it's not a good start, is it? And I think Manchester City is the bigger concern because for me, they're in a tougher group. Sevilla 
are certainly no walkovers, and that ain't an easy group. I know the three teams in City's group have all started this season pretty poorly, but, I mean, you, you really took the chances today. There's going to be some sort of malaise in, in, in kind of <clears throat> with English teams in, in Europe today. I did Paris Saint-Germain, and they were against Malmo, and they won 2-0. They could have won whatever, no, because the goalkeeper was, was pretty decent. And I was talking during commentary to my, my co-host, uh, Alejandro Moreno, about what Paris Saint-Germain would think would be an acceptable competition for them. They've reached the quarterfinals last couple of years, obviously lost to Chelsea and beat Chelsea, then lost to Barcelona. And uh, semi-finals, probably a real good achievement. Quarterfinals, probably expected. But I just don't get City, especially Manchester City, because I think Man United, I mean, look, it's an away defeat. They weren't too bad. They'll turn that around, and it's an easier group than City are in. City have had tough groups since they came into the Champions League, and understandable as well, is because they're coefficient. But it's going to get, but it's going to get, and it's going to get tougher, isn't it? When when, yeah, when, right. uh, when the it's, seasons when the indeed. seasons move on, right? Yeah, and you've got to remember as well. This is the first year where you have to win your league to have a chance of being in pot one. That's why P- I mean PSV. Remember, we're in pot one. This is a team that everybody wanted. Yeah. They've gone and beaten Manchester United. They were in pot one because they had the best coefficient, one of eight. Um, to, to get into to, to the top pot, to the, the best pot. They were seen as the pushovers. But I don't want to go down the whole kind of climax and say, oh, it's no easy games in football and, and use all those terminologies as well. But why did Manchester United not do better against PSV? And, I mean, look, I, I was in PSG today, so I didn't see all of the City game. Did they have most of the chances? Did they play better than Juventus? Bottom line is, they lost 2 1. Bottom, yeah, but, I mean, bottom line back. is, they did have more chances than Juventus, but Juventus scored there too, and mm. City only scored one of theirs, and that's why that's the end result. Yeah, so, so, so what's, what's the issue here as well? Are they not streetwise enough? I mean, look at Arsenal against Monaco last season. Monaco are not a decent French side, Paris Saint Germain are miles ahead of them. But Monaco had, they were streetwise enough to go to the Emirates. And whether it was picking pockets or, or doing whatever they did, they came away with a really good result that Arsenal were unable to overturn. Mm. Why is it? Is it, is it a kind of sense or a semblance of, oh, we're better than that? I thought last year would be a wake-up call for English teams in Europe. But it looks like today, certainly judging by the first two results, that wake-up call wasn't heeded. Well, you know what, Mark? These two managers, right, are both in very difficult positions in that uh, Pellegrini sort of clung on by the, you know, the, the tips of his fingers to his job before the start of this season. And Louis van Gaal has got an enormous amount to, to prove in the domestic competition in this country, he's got to get Manchester United back to the top of the Premier League. So I think both managers in themselves see this, that their priority as the English Premier League, Pellegrini to, re- to regain his title and Louis van Gaal to make United credible in the Premier League again, whilst the owners of the clubs are more interested in them doing well in Europe. And I think that clash of philosophies, to use uh, one of Louis van Gaal's favourite words, has confused all the people at the club as to what their priorities are. Yeah, and priorities is the word, Mike, as well. Remember back in the day when the FA Cup final, that was the day that everyone wanted to be part of. Yeah. It wasn't the European... The European Cup as well. I mean, I'm doing Stevie Nichols' book right now, and he's talking about 1984. Then they won the FA Cup in 1986, and mm. when they beat Everton. The FA Cup was massive back then. It was on a was. par with the, European, with the European Cup final. Yeah. And obviously, 1989, when your boys played Liverpool as, uh, as well, and yeah. a few months after, after Hillsborough happened. That's right. But now the priorities seem to be the Champions League. Mm. Now, I can speak about this because I'm coming from a slightly different angle here. I'll admit, when I first came to America, my knowledge of the rest of European football was dreadful because mm. I didn't really need to know about it. Yeah. I wanted to know about the Premier You're League like Porky, every week. Well, just the man, the man who just stuff. said that, that Sevilla is more famous for oranges than it is for football. It is. Sevilla is more famous but, for oranges than but, football. But, but, but anyway, but you, sorry, go on, Mark. Yeah. But do, do, do you know what it is? If you don't need to know about something, mm. it's your choice to whether you not you want to learn about it and to mm. extend your knowledge. Mm. I then came over here, and I'm doing Dutch football every week. I'm doing French, I'm doing German, I'm doing Spanish. Yeah. I now have a much better knowledge. So it's not a surprise to me if someone like a PSV puts up a good show against Man United. It's mm. not a surprise to me that, that Juve, despite having a poor start to the season, mm. do well against Manchester City. Sure. I think there's a bubble that a lot of English people are in that they don't see beyond the borders. And if something's told to you enough that it's the best league in the world, you end up believing that. And then mm. you get the shock because of your lack of education about what is happening elsewhere. And mm. the, a team that you've never heard of, I mean, look at Astana. 
people wouldn't even know where that was prior to the Champions League taking place this year. Mm. You've got to be able to learn and know these places. And it's the same with, with players as well. You've got to have that scouting network that allows you to be able to go to these places and get the best of their players. Mm. If you're ill-educated, you don't know what's going on elsewhere, that's an issue. And that's why you're surprised when your English teams don't do well in Europe. Mm. Yeah, it could, it could well be. I think we're also surprised as well because the, 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 the teams in Europe now change so rapidly, and I'm talking about English teams as well, Mark, you know what I mean, that you never face yes. the same team for two seasons in yes. succession. And there's an adjustable period in, 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 in meeting the opposition all the time, every season, who it's going to be. But this is the thing as well. I yeah. mean, Juventus, right, won, uh, got, got themselves into the Champions League final yep. last season, but they now haven't got uh, Vidal, they now haven't got Pirlo, um, and or, or um, what's his and, name? He's gone back Tevez to Argentina. Has gone, Tevez has gone to Boca Tevez, yeah. Tevez has That's gone right. as well. So yeah. I mean, you wouldn't say, and they've had a terrible start to their season. But, yeah. but they just seem to be able to manage European football better than Manchester City. Yeah. Because what they do is they continue to evolve. And if someone like Vidal goes, if someone like Tevez goes, you go and get Manjutic or someone mm. like that. You continue to evolve. Pirlo's come over here to NYCFC. So you bring mm. in someone else. I mean, it's it's a foresight as well that you have to be able to, to kind of identify the next generation. Not 17, 18-year-olds, but guys who have got a chance of coming in. I mean, Manchester United have been criticised for spending as much as they did on, uh, on Anthony Martial. Yeah. We, cannot, we cannot sit right now and say yes or no, it's been a good or a bad thing. Mm. You've got to give the guy time. But today, for example, one of my favourite players in Europe is Marco Verratti. Mm. Okay? He's the conductor of the orchestra for PSG. Mm. He sits there, he's an Italian, and he was purchased at the age of 18 for 30 million. Right, that's a lot of money to spend. But he was able right then to go into the team. That's what brought me at the weekend, boys. When you've got a guy like Fellaini, and I think the blame here, I think Van Gaal got away with one at the weekend because of the ineptitude of the opposition to an extent with Liverpool and because of the quality of the rest of the Man United players that earned that win. Why is a lad, if you've spent 35, 40 million on Martial, why not play him? Why would you play Fellaini in attack mm. ahead of a guy you've just spent forty million on? Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's, it's sort of confused thinking, but also I think the Juventus thing is that Juventus are happy in their own skin in being a major European power. They have been for decades. Manchester City are still trying to get that feeling. Yeah, but how long are you going to keep yeah. saying that? I mean, well, we've been well, saying this for four years know, now. But they are. Four they years are. in the Champions they League, They are. Manchester it? City are still trying to come to terms with the fact that they're a recognised, you know, um, uh, stellar club in Europe. Yeah. They, they keep trying to bur burst through the barrier and the barrier keeps falling on the head and yeah. knocking them out. Now, talking of um, uh, not knowing anything about certain uh, areas of sport, Mark, um, Mike's trying to learn a bit about the NFL at the moment. Do you want to give him a quick update of the first weekend. Sorry, since when have I been trying to learn about the NFL? Sorry, well, that's you, knowledge I to thought, me. I thought you said you'd like to know more about it. No, so no, I didn't. Games, no, I, I know live, enough about we're it. We're going to have a lot of live it. games on over the course I, of the season. I know enough about it, Because on don't Thursday worry about night, that. Monday night football, mm, we're going to mm. be watching them. So I just thought you might like an update. You don't want an update? You'd rather remain in ignorance? No, I would love an update from Mark, a man of extreme knowledge on these things, but I don't need, <laughs> you know, sort of uh, baby feeding by um, an ignoramus like you. Mark, please, please go on. Go on, Mark. Well, so, look, over the next five to ten years, Spurs have just signed this new deal, haven't they, that their new stadium is going to host um, an NFL game. That's and there's right. going to be plenty of NFL action I I in London. What the Americans don't get over here is how popular NFL is in the United Kingdom. Mm. And, it, uh, and it's great. A guy who used to be the defensive line coach for the Scottish Playmores, remember them? Oh, yeah. When they used to play back in the day against the London Monarchs and things like that when yeah. the bridge played. Mm. Jim Tom Sula got his first win. Uh, as the new coach of San Francisco 49ers in the late game mm -hmm. last night against Minnesota. Um, Seattle Seahawks, who lost to the New England Patriots. They were surprisingly beaten in overtime by St. Louis. And my mm -hmm. boys, Miami Dolphins, weren't at the best, but they won at Jacksonville. So right. the, the Patriots were on, they were on Thursday night, the uh, defending Super Bowl champions. I'm not sure how much press it had, Mike, over there in the UK. We had the, the game Tom live. Brady. Well, yeah, but I'm talking about the whole deflate. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we covered it on, on, on this show. Yes, it, it, exactly. I don't know if it was mainstream as well. Obviously, you guys are on top of it, as you always are. Mm. Um, but that was the big thing. And that's still rumbling around in the courts as, as well as yeah. what's going to happen next. 
with uh, with Tom Brady. So I think I, I know it's big in the UK at the NFL, but it's only going to get bigger once there's more and more games that take place. It is in the United. And once Paul Kingdom. works out how to get some kind of hospitality box at Wembley for the next game, <laughs> you know, he'll be up there. Listen, hmm. Mark, thank you very much indeed. Uh, as ever, Mark Donaldson there from ESPN giving us a rundown on all the Champions League action from last night and what his view is as well of what's gone wrong for English clubs. And he's right. I don't think they're adventurous enough. I don't think they take enough chances. Yeah. I think they go into Europe thinking they've got to play a different game. If they are such a great team, Manchester City, in the mm. Premier League, why don't they just go in and play the way they play in the Premier League? That's what they don't do. Maybe the managers aren't good enough. That's possibly you true. See, you see, Louis van Gaal, I think, is a bit like Paul McCartney. And that Louis van Gaal's better days are well, behind him. Well, who's his Lennon, then? Sorry? Who's his Lennon? Well, he's not around, is he? What I'm saying is, it's about... No, but, but if he's like Paul McCartney, who it, is his it, it's, it's, a, it's about 40 years since Paul McCartney wrote a decent song. Mm. And I, it seems like nearly 40 years since Louis van Gaal actually brought home the bacon in uh, in footballing terms. Mm. I know he got to a final with Bayern Munich when he was manager there, but he didn't win it. Yeah. And it's a long, long time since he lifted that Champions League. Yeah. Back in the 90s with the Ajax. Mm. I mean, think about that. Yeah. Think about that. It's a long time ago. A long time ago. You were still alive in those days, weren't you? Less than 36 hours to live hadn't happened. Uh, it hadn't actually. No, that happened in. Uh, it was an historic year. It was two thousand. <laughs> you seen Sorry. the time? Yeah, it was two. Well, you You've asked me about. You asked me about no, it. Well, I don't, you'd have to answer it was everything. Two thousand and four. Was it? Eleven Blimey. years. Eleven years. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? Eleven years. Well, and we'll I've, talk about that. I battled on with a you know a tricky dicker, and uh, I'm still a tricky. A tricky, what? T- tricky. <laughs> Sorry, dicky tricker. Dicky tricker. <laughs> dicky tricker. Can yeah. you say anything right? <laughs> Mike Parody's dicky oh, tricker will be back mm. shortly on Talk mm. Sport. <laughs> Talk Sport on DAB Digital Radio and 1089 and 1053 AM. Freedom for sport. Can we kick it? Yes, we can. Talk Sport. Good, glorious food. This is Talk Sport. We are the two mics. Uh, it's Ask Porky coming up a little bit later. And one of the things we have to do, by the way, is yes. we have to figure out what the Porky quiz is going to be on this week. Oh, I've sorted that out. Have you? It's the Battle of Britain. The Battle of Britain? Have because we not done that already? No, 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 we are haven't. Are you sure? I'm certain. Because we've, sure we've done, done Second World War and No, we haven't done Battle really? of Britain. Okay. Because this is the 75th anniversary this week of the, is. of the uh, Battle of Britain Jeremy Day. Jeremy Corbyn's been celebrating, hasn't he? Uh, uh, exactly, or not celebrating yeah. it, yeah. And uh, it, it, quiet it's, respect. it's all about the you know those very brave young men aged 20 years of age, uh, in fact, the few as uh, as Winston Churchill um, uh, designated yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, it's all Never about that. Field Listen, I tell you why we're playing uh, so food glory. So owed by so many to so few. Uh, never has so much been owed by so many. Never to in so the few. field of human Never conflict. Never in the field of I human just conflict. Said that. That's you right. Were yeah, I did. Over me yeah, while I, I was giving you this historical yeah, yeah, quote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you don't deliver them as well as I do. Now, um, the quote that is. Now then, what I was going to say is the reason yeah. why we're playing. Was, it, was that, it tricky dicker? Did you call it? Or no, 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 tricker? no, no. My dicky ticker. Dicky ticker. Dicky ticker. Right. Okay. Okay. The dicky ticker. Right. Now then, uh, what I was going to say was. What were you going to say? Um, I came across this row today about, uh, you know, again, Louis van Gaal, right. uh, that when they all go to the Carrington training ground uh-huh. and uh, they're all about to sort of get out on the field and do the work for the day and all that, yeah. <laughs> none of his players are allowed to go and get their nosh at the uh, breakfast bar right. until he's had his. Is that right? Yeah. Well, I Don't suppose... That's a bit odd. Well, I suppose in some ways that's mm. him trying to mm. impose his personality and say, look, I'm in charge of all you guys, so yes. I'm not going to line up. Because you can imagine the scene if all of the players kind of suddenly all rush together to the buffet. Have you ever been to one of those buffet yeah. Set, uh, yeah. situations and suddenly you find yourself in a queue? Sure. And he couldn't find himself in a queue. That wouldn't be mm. right, would it? Because mm. he would have to then be catapulted to the front, I suppose. Yeah, but I, I, I just think it's ridiculous. I think... Have you ever been in a situation where you've had your breakfast at work and people around you... I mean, I would ban food breakfast in offices at work. altogether. Well, when you and I used to do the mid-morning show, yes. I would often come in with um, a couple oh, of coffees. Hu- and a huge uh, bacon roll. Sometimes a bacon roll, Massive yeah. bacon roll. Well, what was wrong with that? You didn't like that? You never said anything about it. Sorry? You never complained about it. I, I didn't like it. You didn't like no, it? No, I didn't like it. Why no. not? Well, because how can you concentrate when I'm running through the running order of the show tune? You're munching away on this you bacon running roll through anything. for about half an hour. No, you weren't running through yeah, anything. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would. Well, I wouldn't because you wouldn't be able to speak because your, your face was well, full no. of bacon roll. We would have a meeting, as we always did at a certain time, but yes. I would be eating my break bacon yeah. roll before that meeting yeah, took place. Yeah, I know, but I like to start talking the minute you come in, but I couldn't because you were too uh, <laughs> too busy stuffing food into did your you face. Ever, did you ever work out the code for the bacon rolls? 
What do you mean? Well, I sometimes had two bacon rolls. You did have sometimes have two. Sometimes that would be two. a night when you got bladderated the night before. That's right, And yeah. you needed more comfort food in your stomach. Yeah. Um, no, what I was going to say... But I would also bring things in for our production staff, right? Because they oh, would, would I, would, I would always bring an extra coffee in. Right. Uh, I would always bring sometimes a, uh, a bacon roll from one of them. Or yes. possibly, you know, but you would bring nothing in for them. No. Because you just expect them to be your slaves. No, 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 that's not true at all. I, th- I think it's rude... And I think it's ill-disciplined and slovenly to eat any food at work, and it should be banned. Because it's... it's well, hang on. You can't have it yeah. both ways. The way things are at the moment yes. is that people, generally speaking, are not really out going out for lunch anymore because yeah. that, those days are past. Uh, uh, that where I agree. you wander out and you come back four hours later uh, grounded, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, nowadays, of course, you're supposed to sit at your desk mm. and have lunch there. Well, no, that's, you see, that's wrong. That must not be allowed. That well, should, what, that well, should what, be... well what's, your, what's your medium sort of ground, then? Where you have you... to find an area in the office where people can go and sit down and eat their well, bodies or something like that. there is that, there is like that, that. here. There's, there's, yeah, an area, there's an area in the kitchen where they can do that. The problem is there are too many filthy slobs in every office, right? And you often come across, you know, disused containers, yeah. filthy plates with yeah. filthy knives and forks right. left on them, yeah. uh, filthy wrappings from yeah. filthy sandwiches. What do you mean filthy? Um, Why do you keep oh, using they the are word filthy. filthy? They are filthy. You've got I'm, OCD or something. Sorry? You've got OCD well, or something. Well, maybe I have, or maybe I just like a clean working environment. But mm. I think eating in the office is disgusting. Do you mind if I drink a cup of coffee while no, we're on the air? No, cup of coffee's all right, but don't spill it on the equipment because you'll damage it, which has happened many, many times what about in if, these studios. What if, that's why, if this famous Battenberg cake ever gets made and not eaten, would you like me to bring you some? In then or no, not? no, I'll eat it in the break out in the kitchen because we've ah. got a kitchen area in this uh, building. That's ah. fine, that's okay. fair enough. Yeah. But I, I mean, I totally object to particularly breakfast, people coming and starting their day by eating their breakfast. If you can't arrive at work, you know, in, in, in good shape, having, you know, well, showered and cleaned you yourself then. and come you're, to you're, work you're and somebody, had your breakfast, right, hang on, you're somebody... then I'm sorry, you shouldn't use the first hour of your working day as an extension of your domestic routine at home, which you transfer to the office. That should be disallowed. Breakfast must be disallowed. banned in the office. It's completely <laughs> disallowed. I tell you what, I tell you what, in previous situations when well, I've been when in charge, well, I you. have thrown people out of the newsroom really? for trying to eat their bacon no butty when they come in there. No wonder you either eat that bacon boss. butty in the canteen somewhere down Stairs, or you eat it at home, but you don't bring it into my working environment so that we start smelling like a yeah. greasy but spoon see, cafe. See, that's where you've got it wrong. It's not a your, greasy spoon no, on, cafe. Excuse me, this is where you've got it wrong. It's not your working environment. It's everybody's working no, it's environment. Not. Well, I'm in charge of the place. It's my working environment. Yeah, well, you're not in charge of it now. I'm not in charge of the place, but I was in charge of the Daily Express newsroom, and I wouldn't let people bring. And it was a very nice newsroom when we moved to our new building. Mm-hmm. Beautiful furniture. Unlike, unlike. Did I ever tell you the smoking story? Unlike, well, hang on. Let me just tell you. Unlike oh the, no, sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt you. Five minute well, well, you weren't interrupting. The Fleet Street offices were filthy. We had uh, those fruit fly things and we had mice and fruit all sorts fly of things. What yeah. do you mean? Well, little flies that fly around fruit. from flu- fruit. 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 Fruit fries. Anyway, go on. Tell me about the smoking. Go <laughs> well, on. I kept my first day, yes. uh, you had gone to America, right? Oh, after I'd given you the job, yes. Well, I'd been given the job by the editor of the no, paper. No, uh, uh, on my I, know that, I know that you had recommended me. Thank yes. you very much indeed yes. for that. Mm. Uh, I came in and it was my first day uh, in the job, and you had gone to live in my apartment in New York, you know, to become mm. the American mm. roving correspondent. Oh, which all went horribly wrong some months later. Of course later. it did, because... Um, anyway, I hang was, on. Uh, you know, I was more used to people in Fleet And I was Street. wearing mm. this suit that I was very proud of. It was a double-breasted uh, Prince of Wales checked suit oh, that I'd bought in Neiman Marcus in Beverly Hills, that right? That sounds ludicrous. What do you mean ludicrous? Well, it was it, a very, very fine Italian uh, You know the thing with check suiters, they make fat people look fatter, so you must have looked well, ghastly. Well, it was in the days when you wore uh, double-breasted suits. They were the sort of trend, yeah. you know. Yeah. I think you used to wear them yourself. If you, I did, actually. Yeah, yeah. you did. Mm. Uh, so I came and I sat down, and I was the first reporter in for some reason mm. and you could You're trying to impress on day one well no i don't think so i just mm. was you know i came in because i was used to working for myself so i mm. wasn't you know on a clock mm. i was just like well i'll just you know i'll come mm. in when i come in mm. anyway this guy comes in i'm yes. not going to give his name away because yes. he ended up working for you at, a, at another place mm. um and he came up and I was really? sitting there and I was sitting there. Well, don't, well, don't think of who it was. Okay. Right? I was going to give his name away because okay. he's not. I don't believe he's dead. Right. right so okay. anyway, okay. he comes up to me where I'm sitting having a cigarette, and he said, um, "He said, excuse me. Uh, he said, Are you Mike Graham?'" I said, "Yeah." Mm. He said, "Oh, pleased to meet you. I'm so and so." And I went, "Oh, very nice to meet you." Mm. And um, he said, "Oh, by the way," he said, um, "Do you know this is a no smoking area?" And I said, really? Who said it was a no-smoking area? Mm. He said, oh, well, we all had a vote, and um, it was declared a no-smoking area. And I said, by who? He said, by Mike Parry. And he oh, said, well, really? <laughs> he said, and I said, well, do you know where Mike Parry is at the moment? And he went, uh, 
Well, yeah, he's in New York. I said, yeah, he's in my apartment in mm. New York, and he's not yeah. here anymore. So I tell you what, why don't you start the no smoking area over there where you sit, mm. and I'll sit here mm. and I'll smoke. Is that mm. okay? See how belligerent and, went, and aggressive and he is went, that on your first day. And he, and he just went and backed off and sat down. It was great. Mm. It was brilliant. Yeah. I just sat there smoking. And you, so immediately they identified you as a, a loudmouth bully. Well, I'd come who, from New York, who, so you know, what are you going to do? Who, who was determined to do as do it as he wanted <laughs> it against the wishes. Well, I wasn't going to do what he wanted. Against, why would the, I? against the wishes of the rest of the no, newsroom. Because because your empire was dead and buried. What an arrogant, and he was so frightened bullying, of you. you he, know, was so, he was so frightened of you that he was still, you know, kind of, you know, t- preaching your mantra, people, even though you were three thousand miles away. People weren't frightened of me. People respected me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are you laughing? At? Anyway, uh, so so there we are. Your your legacy. Yes. Uh, was yes. as soon as I got there, your no smoking policy but, was, was other, immediately abandoned. There was nothing wrong with my legacy. But um, soon, soon, quite soon thereafter, of course, smoking was banned. You know, yeah. a couple of years later, anyway, as it, as it should have been. And if they'd abandoned it earlier, you'd be in much better shape now, wouldn't you? Now, how about this from Ian, who's tweeted yeah. at uh, IROMG? He says, "I didn't vote for you, MG, but it's always good to see Porky squirm." <laughs> no, I'm not squirming at all. Something wrong with that voting system, and we're going to change it for next week. Russell says, uh, "Well, why are we going to change it? I mean, well, you are you are the mm. most unbelievable bad loser. Just nope. because you've lost, right? Nope. And it's now two-two. Mm. You want to change the system yes. next week? If you win, you yeah. want to keep the system as it is. Well, there is course. no better system than the one we have. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about that. I think Dave says there's something going. On. You see, you know, you know more about the electronics of the way that phones and things work. Uh, than the I magic do. world of electronics. No, no, no. You do. You the do mystery s- world. You do something. Which this from the man who thinks segways work by magic. Oh, oh by the way, have you seen that? Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. Segway are suing mm. the company that run, run the other things. What are the other things called? What those two footed things? Yeah, you're talking they're about? called they're called automatons or something. Hang on, what are automatons. they called? Well, no, they are automatons. No, I've got it written down here. Honestly. <laughs> here you are. Have you? It says Segway well, Sue Hoverboard. They're hoverboard. called hoverboards. No, hoverboards are things from Back to the Future that no. don't need anything except for the air yeah, to well, hover well, well, Segway, I read today, I'll sue an hoverboard for nicking some of the technology which makes a Segway work. So what? How about that? So what? Well, I mean, it's, a, it's brilliant breaking news, that man. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I'm telling you. Yeah. How does hoverboard work, then? Hoverboard works by, on exactly the same principle, leaning forward or leaning backwards. And, in fact, in fact, funny enough, I had another brilliant idea, uh, as Ben is in the studio here. I'm Why are you pointing at him? Yeah, I'm going to get our producer to bit. ring up hoverboard. The executive producer. Yes, ring up hoverboard and get two hoverboards on APRO, that's on approval. APRO. And you and I are going to have a race down the road <laughs> and film it <laughs> to see who can, who can, most, who can well, master the hoverboard. And movement. I'll tell you what, I'll win that. Do you know what? I d- well, it'll be the first thing you've won since we've no, no. been working together. And I'll tell you why, because I did water skiing a few years ago for the first time you in 15 water years. Skiing. Yeah. Where's the evidence? And, and, where's and, the evidence? And I was brilliant. I got right where's the way the, round the, the island picture? without Where? falling off. What my island? balance, my balance what, technique those, is brilliant. What, in one of those mini golf islands? No, no, you idiot. Around Necker Island, actually, which belongs to well, Richard Branson. Where's the pictures? Well, I've got any pictures. Oh, you haven't got any pictures. Well, how do you take a picture when you're, well, when you're water take, skiing? Well, how about the person on the boat? Why don't you take a picture of you? Well, I don't know. Perhaps you didn't have a camera. You had a boat. Well, perhaps I, I, I you know, I, I didn't do it for the, my personal glory. I did it for my personal satisfaction. Did you? Yes. I don't believe a word of it. Mm. Does anybody else believe that Porky can water ski? Well, maybe we'll go I water can. skiing together. Yeah, OK, yeah. Excellent I'm, plan. I'm brilliant at it. It'll be a good way to kill you off. The technique is you've got to keep your knees right up near your chest. That's what it's <laughs> all. <talking. laughs> what right. are you laughing at? That is not the technique. It anyway, is a technique. Have you seen the time? Look. We are the two mics. Uh, there's lots more to come on the show. We're going to talk about uh, an, uh, um, an airline uh, a little bit later on that has started to uh, ban some of its stewardesses and aircrew from flying. Yes. They've got too fat, would you believe? That'll be right up your street because you like that kind of behaviour, don't you? Well, what do you mean? Well, you like that sort of ban. I mean, you like banning people well, well, for, uh, you know, no, for not looking no, right. No, I believe in stringent uh, disciplinary standards. And if people are so unaware of their... The image they should be portraying to their company, they let them, their, their bodily form um, b- uh, sort of bulge out of control, then, of course, they, they should be banned. Bulge out of control. There's some great pictures coming in, by the way, yes. uh, of you on water skis. Well, that's because uh, I Sam has t- uh, yes. tweeted this one. I'll show it to you in a mm. second. Uh, MGC's Porky's water skiing skills and raises the bar. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's one there. So look. 
that's 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 actually me on a on a surfboard or something like that. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, I've got Nick saying I don't want a picture of Porky water skiing. Mm. I would want one to prove he can actually get his knees up to his chest. No, 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 no. You don't understand. You see, let me explain what's going on here. I was out in the uh, British Virgin Islands, yeah. okay, and somebody said, "Oh, we're all on going a freebie, water skiing." Right? Um, on a facility uh, mission. Yeah. And uh, what happened was, what happened was, we were actually staying on Necker, and, and they've got their own facility at the back of the island, you know, with a ramp and all this kind of stuff. Had you ever water skied before? Only ever once, and that was at Bucklin's Holiday Camp in Pathelli. Oh, when you were six? In a lake, yeah, when I was about six. Seriously. Yeah, rubbish. No. It's, they would um, not have let you water ski I, at the age of six. They did. They, no. had, they had... I went jet skiing, right, in Mexico. Yeah. I took my son jet skiing yes. for the first time. When I went and asked them what the minimum age for going on a jet yeah. ski was, they said ten. Yeah, this wasn't a jet ski. No, I know, but you can't water ski at the age of six. They were lessons for kids to water Rubbish. ski. So there was... I'm telling you, man. Absolute cobbler. So there was an instructor in the water who helped you get on your skis and all that, and then the boat went off gently and all that. That was the only water skiing experience. should have had a U-boat in the water that, that, to save you. That was the only water skiing experience I'd ever had, right, in this big lake and yeah. all that. So when they said... I said, oh, I'm not, I'm not sure. Anyway, I got on these skis. The boat started off, went very fast. Well, to both skis. What? You went on both skis. What do you mean? Well, water skiing. Well, you got all these skis, you said. Well, you have two skis no, when you, you water have ski. One. No, you have two. You have one ski. I had two. Why would you have two? One on each foot, you idiot. No, you have one thick ski. That's no, what water no, skiing no, is. No, 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 no. In those days, it was two skis, not two, two planks, skis. Two planks of and wood. And by the way, that's it. That's <laughs> and a e- plank on top of them. That, that... <laughs> Oh, I, I think I, I. Do you know what? I'm. I'm beginning to wonder about your. Uh, you know your. Uh, your head. I think I might I, be drinking I, too much coffee. I, I, I think. Yeah, I think you are. I think you've been. You know, the producer's been coming in, filling your your cup with coffee for the last hour now. Yeah. Now, what's going to say is. That's even harder to keep on a narrow uh, path, a straight path, straight narrow well, it's path. It's very difficult to keep two be, be, skis exactly. which are separate in exactly. the water. Exactly. There's exactly. no way you could do it as a six-year-old. You haven't got the strength. I wasn't a six-year-old when said... I went to Necker and I took up water skiing again. Right. I was probably in my early 40s or something, so right? So it's approximately 30-odd years yeah, later. Yeah, it was, yeah. And I got on these skis. And do you know who was uh, who was uh, helping me do it? I have no idea. Valerie Singleton. Valerie Singleton? Valerie Singleton. I went on a golfing trip with her once. Funny enough, she was on Very the nice island woman. at the same time. Very nice woman. Yeah. Indeed. She said, look, it's just like this. Do the, Bend your knees a little bit. Lean back. When the boat starts going, just lift yourself up out of the water. Just concentrate. Just look straight where ahead. Where was she, then? What do you mean, where was she? Well, where was she giving you this advice from? On the beach. Oh, so this is before you were actually in the yeah, water. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's easy to yeah. describe what yeah, you're supposed yeah. to do. No, no, she came in the water with me when I got on the skis. And all yeah, this yeah. Kind of stuff. Anyway, so I went roaring off. And I went right the way round the island without falling off. I was I absolutely amazed you. with myself. Well, I can't believe they didn't film it. Hey, eh? Why well, didn't they film it? Why would they film it? I'm not... I'm not I'm not a huge celebrity in uh, in um, uh, BVI, <laughs> you know, British Virgin Islands. Well, you're not a huge celebrity anywhere. Well, no, I, 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 I accept that. Listen, Apart I want to tell, I want to tell you something. You know, you were just talking about... I haven't um, finished with the, uh, with the complimentary okay. emails yet. OK, go on. And then. the text. Here's one mm-hmm. uh, from Def, who says, Porky on a hoverboard, Def. pigs mm. might as well fly. Yeah. Uh, then uh, one from Bill. Uh, Here, MG, give us a parry and autom- ultimatum. Stop talking cobblers. Mm. Uh, and then Paul says, wow, Porky's going into meltdown. He's going to explode. Give him a sausage roll and tell him to calm down. No, 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 no. None of that uh, makes any sense to me. Mm. Now, you were talking about uniforms there because uh, you say an airline is going to uh, get tough with the people. Yeah, it's who true. Are... Air India, apparently. Right. I want to tell you about some people in uniforms, yeah, right? And I hope they're listening at the moment. Which um, people in uniforms? Well, I'm going to tell you now. I'm reading from the front page of tomorrow morning's Times, OK? Yeah, all right. And the headline is Britain sends warship to stop people smugglers, OK? Yeah. This is written by Deborah Haynes, the defence editor. Uh-huh. And it says Britain will offer a warship today with 200 sailors and Royal Marines for Europe's first offensive mission against people smugglers in Libya during the migrant crisis, OK? Right. Uh, sorry, driving the migrant crisis, I'm sorry. Right, now, the, the, this is what's crucial about this story, Mike. Listen to this. HMS Richmond... A Type 23 frigate... That's our friends, HMS Richmond. I was about to say. HMS Richmond, a Type 23 frigate, equipped with a Lynx helicopter and surveillance drone, is set to assist the operation in international waters between North Africa and the Italian coast from next month until mid-December. Now, we have a pal, don't we, on board HMS Richmond? And we do, indeed, yeah. Mm-hmm. A very, very good contact. Exactly. Yeah, I don't want to give his name away no. in case, uh, you know, that might jeopardise his I position. I think you're absolutely right. But the point is, um, we are told that in the wardroom aboard HMS Richmond... At this time of night, wherever they are in the world, they're picking up 
uh, the programme, the two mics. They, they, and... they broadcast the podcast in the officers' mess. Is that right? Yeah. In the officers' mess. And, well, and, around, and around the rest of the ship. So we just want to say, fellas, um, you know, it's a shout-out for you guys in HMS Richmond. You're doing a brilliant job, a splendid job for the Royal Navy, for this country out there. Keep it going, guys. We're all proud of you. How about that? Uh, very nice indeed. Thank yes. you. That's sort of un- unusually magnanimous of you. Not at all. These guys are, are brilliant. Well, you Remember. tweeted something the other day, which I know was half in jest. What was that? Uh, when somebody said, well, what about the listeners say something or other? And you said, well, why would we care what the listeners think? I didn't say that. Yeah, you did. On no, Twitter you did. No, I didn't. I know oh, you're only really joking. No, no, I wouldn't. I would never say that. I would no. never say that. Um, now but, listen to this from Jason. But remember, my father was in the Royal Navy. You know, I'm. You say, no, you say. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I mean, that's another. Un- what do you mean, un- so unproven, I say? Well, that's don't be so insulting. Unproven fact. Rubbish. My well, father was in the Royal Navy for six years. You got a picture 19... of you got a picture of him in the Royal Navy. My mom has. Has she? Yeah, absolutely. But no picture of you water skiing. No, no, no picture, picture of you with Bill Clinton. Uh, no, we couldn't get one. No picture of you with Joan Collins. Yes, there is a picture of me and Joe Well, we Collins. still haven't seen it. Well, I can produce that. Right. That's not a problem. Jason says, mm. uh, can you please ask Mike Perry to say yes. Juventus again, uh, because and then you can tell him there is no J in the Italian language. Hashtag uh, fool. I say Juventus. You said Juventus before. No, Juventus. All right, because, I mean, you'd have to say Jason then, wouldn't you? I know Juventus very well. I first went to Juventus uh, <laughs> years ago, and there was a riot there involving the England fans. I've told you about it, the guy who got the gas canister in the face and all that. Uh-huh. That was in Juventus. Was it? Mm. Is Juventus a place, then? Well, it's in Turin, isn't it? Yeah, it's not a place, is it? Well, I mean... That's... I went to Juventus. Well, Juventus well, is a ground... Juventus. It... Yeah, but it's a ground where a football team play, mm. OK? And it's in Turin. Yeah. OK? Got that straight? No, I haven't got it You're straight. You're very slow off the mark tonight. There's something wrong with your brain. Here's one from Russell. He says, I hope Porky's dicky tricker can take the defeat. Yeah, sorry, that, that should have been my dicky ticker. Yes, I know. To, uh, just to, and uh, Max says, self-catapulted at the front of the muffin queue, Porky. Mm. Uh, why do you find Van Hal controlling Man United's breakfast rude? Well, I don't like people eating breakfast at work. I, th- I think that's a terrible... Um... No, I know, you've already said all that. Yeah, but, yeah, but it's a terrible example but, of... But of he's of referring your... to that episode where you came in one night yes. having jumped the queue in the shop with the muffin, do you remember? Oh, yeah, well, I was late and uh, I needed to be here. The, the, uh, you know, the nation was awaiting my wise words oh, okay. and I didn't want to be late. And Woodenhead says, I bet that's the only time anyone has ever seen a whale water skiing. Oh, ha, 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 uh, ha. And he says they didn't film it because they couldn't find a camera with a wide enough lens to fit his ample frame in. Yeah, I mean, that, I'm sorry, is such a basic criticism that I'm not going to respond and to. And Ray okay? says, uh, did you get a Blue Peter badge if Valerie Singleton was there? Well, funny enough, I mean, she uh, she was on Blue Peter for years, wasn't she? She was. And uh, and then she became a travel correspondent, actually. That's yeah. why she was there. She happened to be doing a well, piece yeah, well, on well, that. I, was on a, I, was on a, I went on a golf trip to Arizona. She right. was on that trip. Oh, well, well, there you go, there you go, yeah. Did you have any socialisation with her? I uh, had a few drinks with her in the Did evening, you? yeah. She's a very nice, sociable woman, you know, and uh, told some great stories about... Did you try some... and lure her to your first-class bedroom? No, of course not. Anything? Of course not. But she told some great stories about some great old friends, you know, like Bruce Forsyth and people like that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she was very good company. Mm. Indeed. Excellent. I wonder mm. if she'd say the same about you. This is Talk Sport. Yeah, we she are would, the actually. Two mics. She would. I was a gentleman. All right. Believe well, we'll, me. Maybe we'll get her on one night. Yeah. This is Talk Sport. All the two mics. There will be uh, a podcast coming out a little bit later on. Of course, Sandra Lee's going to come up uh, in a little mm-hmm. while from Australia to tell us all about how they managed to get themselves a new Prime Minister in a couple of days. I, th- I think he's seems... the seventh in eight years or something. It's the fourth in five years, certainly. Fourth in five, is yeah. it? Yeah. So and the other guy's taken more. over, Malcolm Turnbull. Yeah. You, you know what he's most famous for? No. He, was, he was the lawyer involved in the spy catcher row. Do you remember? Oh, was he? Malcolm Turnbull. Yeah, yeah. When they, when they tried, when they tried to publish the, the exactly, book in exactly. Australia, and Mrs. Thatcher tried to stop it. Exactly, that's right. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. he's got a good record in that situation. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that was a song called "American Dream," by yeah. the way, by Who's Crosby, Still, Nash and Young. Really? Who I think are on tour here, aren't they? Well, Crosby, Stills and Nash are. Yeah. And the reason I mentioned this to you earlier, and, mm. our, and our uh, our uh, uh, tech op p- picked up on it, is that I've never seen such a an old and gnarled face. As that of uh, David Crosby. I'll tell you what, David Crosby is actually on Twitter. He's quite funny on Twitter. Is he? Because he's quite sort of acerbic and right. quite often will be uh, more than happy to. to oh, actually, actually, some sorry. Of, some of his fellow. Uh, uh, some of his fellow um, musicians, yeah. shall yeah. we say. Sorry, I've got the old and old face wrong. It's not... Um, who did I say it was? David so, Crosby. No, it's not. It's Graham Nash. Oh, Graham, Graham Nash. Graham Nash's face. Well, he's the guy from the Hollies, isn't he? Well, this is the point. I remember him in the Hollies yeah. and, and uh, you know... Um, well, he's probably in his 70s now, Well, what I was going to say is in the Hollies, he, he, he produced all these... Uh, wrote and produced all these great songs yeah. like uh, Bus Stop and... Um, Bus Stop, yes. And uh, Look Round Any Corner. What was that one the day that Crazy Larry shot down somebody what McGee? What can I do? What? What was that one the day know. that Crazy Larry shot down But all of a sudden, the Hollies produced two fantastic songs, didn't they? He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother. Yes. 
and uh, all that I need is the air that I breathe. Yes. You know, they're fantastic songs. Yeah. But here, look, I'm going to show you a picture of Graham Nash's face now. Yeah. Now, look, he's the guy holding the guitar with the white hair. Right. For the benefit of our listeners, I'm, I'm showing Mr Graham a picture, a still here we've got from the stage show earlier this week yeah. of uh, Stephen Stills and Graham Nash standing next to each other. Yeah. Stephen Stills Stephen has got Stills. A, a suit on and looks yeah. reasonably... Sort of middle age. Well, David Crosby looked. Is, if, you, if you saw a picture of him, you would say he looked even even more old. Well, it, but, I mean, they're ancient these guys, aren't they? Yeah, yeah but David Crosby's like man mountain now, isn't yeah. he? In fact, I don't know how they find a stool for him to sit on with his uh, acoustic guitar in his yeah. hand because that stool must have unbelievable um, pressure bearing joints or something <laughs> or, so, or something like that. But I mean, no, what I'm saying is. If I got to Graham Nash's age mm. and looked like that, I don't think I'd get on stage anymore. Why not? Perhaps I'm being unkind. I think you are being Am unkind. Am I being unkind? I think you are. Okay. Because, I mean, you don't say the same about uh, Rolly Wood or Keith Richard. Or, I mean, you know how haggard they look at these. Yeah, and yeah, even that, Mick that Jagger. That is very haggard looking, isn't well, it? Well, it's, it's a picture of him uh, in mid sort of uh, guitar riff. Yes. And quite often when guitarists play their guitar, yes. they kind of scrunch up their face and, you know, he's staring down as well, which mm. doesn't always, it's probably not mm. his best look. I think you're being very unkind. But anyway, to be positive here, I scr- Scrolled through the old internet and I found a review by a guy called Mick Brown, who's oh, yeah. the reviewer for the Mick Brown, very famous rock critic, Daily Telegraph. Yeah. Is he famous? He's yeah, very okay. famous, yeah. And he gave them four stars out of five for their performance at the Hammersmith uh, Apollo. Yes. He also says that David Crosby, the guy you've just talked about, the guy who is acerbic and rather heavy, remains the finest voice. His singing on Guinevere, high, strong and true. Yeah. One of the finest so uh, saying, voices in pop they've, music. They've still got it. So if they've still yep. got it, then by yep. all means, I think they should, should still do it. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Now, talking about uh, people's views of other people's sort of body image, some right. people are giving you a bit of grief over that, by the way. Over what? You, you shouldn't be giving you know, your views on other people's body images. Well, I'm only being honest. I mean, here's one from Dazza, who yes. says, Old and gnarled face, has Porky mm. not looked in the mirror lately? Oh, that's a bit Hashtag harsh. Hashtag living in denial. Uh, hey, that's that's, uh, that's uh, very harsh. And then uh, mm. Mark says, mm. I'm listening to this water skiing story. Mm, you sure mm. Mike Perry isn't confusing his past with an episode of Blue Peter? No, uh, no, hashtag of Tracy not. Island episode. <laughs> no, not at all. And but Def, I, I understand the connection with Def Def says, Singleton. Yeah. Porky's like a living, breathing mm. Monty Python four Yorkshireman sketch. <laughs> What? Well, you've gone mad. What are you talking about? <laughs> Luxury. Yeah. Now, this is a story after your own heart, because as soon as I saw this, I thought of you. Air India, right, yeah, yeah. is going to ground 125 mm. of its hostesses, uh, air hostesses and other cabin crew. Yeah. I mean, we don't actually call them that anymore. This is a story uh, that ran, uh, I think, in one of the uh, Indian uh, uh, International okay. Business Times. Maybe in the Times. Because we, we, Times of India is no, a very it's, famous well, it's, newspaper. No, it's, it's, it's the International Business Times. Oh, it's slightly different. Right. Um, but I take your point. But we would call them air crew now. You don't call them air hostesses, do you? Yeah. Uh, but uh, 125 of them... Uh, because they are too fat to fly. Yeah. Uh, according to uh, mm. uh, PTI, the 125 personnel who do not meet the ideal weight requirements mm. set by the Directorate General of Civil Aviation yes. will either be asked to retire voluntarily or be given ground duties. Right. That seems a bit harsh. And if they it? lose weight, do they get back in the air? Well, let's see. According to a mm. report in the Mumbai Mirror, right. um, the cabin crew members have been given 18 months mm. to meet the compulsory weight requirement. Um, uh, but until that time, yes. uh, they are basically unfit for flying. Well, I, I have to say, I admire Air India for doing this. I, I think that um, discipline amongst people in certain professions, and I would nominate ambulance crews, uh, certain areas of the I mean, police certainly, force. certainly, I suppose you have to get down quite yeah, a narrow yeah. aisle, don't you? Yeah, 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 you do, yeah. But, uh, you know, there are some people who clearly aren't fit enough to do the jobs that they're paid to do. Fortunately, we and, don't and have to be uh, subjected to those of, kinds of rigours. Some of that is in public services, um, which we pay for, obviously, through yeah. our taxes and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but isn't some this, of that is in the private sector. I mean, like all of these things, mm. right? I mean, I'm not a big fan of, of yeah. the body mass index measurement of yeah. how to make sure whether people are fat or mm. not. I mean, this is kind of um, a terrible invasion, in a way, of privacy. What they're basically saying, is, is that a body mass index of 18 to 25 is yeah. considered normal for males, yeah. uh, and it's something like 25 to 29.9 is overweight, while 30 and above is categorised as obese. And for women, uh, again, between what 18... What is yours? And, uh, I don't know. I've never measured it. I think I was measured once years and years ago, mm. and it was about 25 or 26, uh, you know, yeah. which made, technically made me borderline obese, right? Which borderline I was like, well, that's ridiculous. Obese, yeah. um, I don't think it's fair for people who are, you know, so, sh- shall we say, slightly overweight, you yeah. know, people are, yeah. to be told, well, I'm sorry, you can't do this job. Have you ever flown on Air India? Uh, I used to fly on Air India a lot, actually. Didn't uh, Brian Vine, our old colleague at mm. the Express, he had some sort of a deal, and whenever he flew back from New York to London and London, New mm. York, he always flew on Air India? Yeah, well, I used to fly a lot from New York to London because they were quite cheap tickets. I mean, I didn't yeah. go, this was when I was young, a lot younger, yes. and I would quite often fly back and forth. The trouble with Air India, I used to find, was that by the time the plane had reached um, London, yes. it had come from Mumbai, 
Mumbai or somewhere, right? Right. And it had stopped in Delhi. Uh, it had stopped in Vienna or yes. somewhere. It had stopped in London. Then yeah. it was on its way to New York. People had sort of set up house there. You know, yeah. there were people literally, um, you know, who had been on the plane for practically 13 or 14 hours. Yes. So it wasn't a pleasant environment, if you know what I mean. Uh, no, I don't know what you mean. Well, I'm if sorry. you've been on a long flight, yes. there's something about the inside kind of air of a plane. Yes, I see Which is not, it's kind of stale. Well, it's well, not ple- you know, when you get on a flight in London, which is taking off from London. Yes, I understand. You yeah. get on and it's clean and they yeah, just, yeah. They've sure. just cleaned it, you know. But they haven't cleaned anything because they've got people that have been on the plane yeah, for a I very see. long time. I That's f- my point. I flew uh, Pakistan International Airways once. That used to be a very good airline, didn't it? Well, funny enough, it was an internal flight. Uh, in Pakistan. In Pakistan. Yeah. From Lahore yeah. to Karachi, I think. Right, and um, it was it was the most bizarre flight I've ever been on really? because yeah, I was in the departure lounge. I was with a doctor mm. uh, who sort a of doctor. befriended. Yeah, he just befriended me because I was. Um, what happened is I fl- thought he looked a bit unwell. No, he didn't. No, I'd flown there with Benazir Bhutto, who oh, took yeah. the country over, mm. and then you know stayed for about a few days, and then I had to get back. Um, you know, some bizarre, strange route back, which uh, which I'll tell you about later. But anyway. Uh, when I was waiting in the uh, departure lounge, uh, this doctor realised I was English. He came over and he said, you know, how are you? I said, and he was flying back to England because hmm. he was a, a, doctor in, a doctor in practice in England. Oh, yeah. he, he said, you shouldn't wait uh, this far back in the lounge. I said, oh, why is that then? He said, well, you see that ticket you have in your hand? I said, yeah. He said, it's got a seat number on it. I said, yeah. He said, it doesn't mean anything on this airline. I said, oh, what do you mean? He said, as soon as those doors open, yeah. there'll be a stampede so to get on the plane. Yeah, yeah, it's a complete free-for-all. Right. And people always go for the front seats. Mm. And I said, oh, why is that then? He said, because the people at the back usually bring all their luggage on uh-huh. because they have excess luggage. Right. And they include, and this is, this is what happened, live chickens and things like oh, this, yeah. livestock. Right. People I mean, have told me about that. That sort of yeah. thing happens in South America. Yeah, well. that's right. Lots of livestock was brought onto the plane right. because they were transferring it from wherever they were to somewhere else, you right. know. And and I said anyway, he muscled me through to the front. And when uh-huh. the gates, when the you know the doors opened, I mean, you were travelling in sort of cattle class, were you? Well, that's, that's all there was. It was an oh. internal flight. Oh, it wasn't okay. any business or first or anything. Right. And he, and he said, like, let's run. And we sprinted across the because it wasn't. Um, we weren't, you know, in a lounge. There was no jetway. No, there was no jetway. Yeah. You, you ran to the steps of the plane and mm. and and got on. And uh, and the plane was overcrowded. It's the first time I've ever been on an aeroplane where people were standing up in the aisle as the plane took off. Really? Like a bus. Wow. Yeah, yeah seriously. It doesn't yeah. sound very safe. No, it doesn't sound very safe, but the problem is that they didn't have, like, um, sort of modern ticket-checking mm. systems, so they didn't want to throw anybody off the plane yeah. because they didn't know what time the next one was coming and all that kind of stuff, you bizarre. know? Bizarre. Yeah, it was bizarre, but anyway. No, and because, so you flew to Karachi? No, flew to Karachi. And what did you do there? I, th- I flew from Karachi to Athens, mm. and then that was when I had to get into Libya, and we flew across the Sea oh, of right. Death to uh, Tripoli. The yeah, Sea of Death? On one occasion, yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's what Colonel Gaddafi called yeah, it. Yeah, I know that's what he called it. it but everybody I mean, else called it the Mediterranean. Everybody else called it the Mediterranean. Yeah, he called it the Sea of Death. Yeah. Well, yeah. it wasn't really the Sea of Death, was it? Well, it would have been if they'd shot the plane down. Yeah, but they didn't, they did they? To. No, they didn't on so, that occasion, no. So it was the Sea of Tranquility, yeah, in many ways. Yeah, Sea of Tranquility. Now, yeah. uh, coming up next, mm. a bit more politics. We're going to talk, yeah. we talked about yeah. Jeremy Corbyn last night. Uh, coming up, we've got Sandra Lee, uh, our very Excellent. good friend down in Sydney, Australia. Yeah. Uh, she's going to tell us about this new uh, Prime Minister they've got. Yes. Uh, and there might be a couple of other stories as well. Uh, this is Talk Sport. We have podcasts coming out and, of course, coming up a little bit later in the show, it's Ask Porky. We've got lots of great mm-hmm. questions, personal problems, business uh, worries, you know, um, investment questions, anything you like. Uh, you can tweet them at the two mics and uh, if they're particularly good, uh, you'll get them read out live uh, on the air. Mm. Right now, though, it's time to go down to New, Ze- uh, sorry, I said New Zealand, Australia, uh, for Sandra Lee, our correspondent down in Sydney, uh, where they've got a new prime minister. Sandra, very good morning to you. Good morning to you two, Mike's, and to all your lovely listeners. And Thank w- you very welcome, much. Welcome, and, and I'm pleased to say that uh, um, four prime ministers in five years seems a little bit careless. I mean, are they going for the sort of Italian record down there? <laughs> mm. <laughs> it, it seems like it, and in fact, if you actually count a repeat of one of them, it's five prime ministers in five years. So you could quite frankly say that our national parliament is a bit of a goat rodeo at the moment. It certainly is. Mm. And I mean, what's, I mean, tell us, because it all seemed to happen very quickly. You were actually, your tweets actually were the first thing that alerted me to it know, a couple of days ago that something was going on, because it seemed to come out of nowhere, this. 
Well, it sort of started around February when there was a, a push for a possible leadership overthrow that never happened. Mm. And so obviously for the last sort of six to seven months, there's been sort of rumblings in the background and nobody has ever put their hand up to be the potential contender until Monday, just as the parliament resumed for another session of sitting. And the um, communications minister, Malcolm Turnbull, decided that he would um, challenge the prime minister, the incumbent, even though he's always been suspended as being sort of one of the chief leakers and um, against the Prime Minister, and that's what he did, and he rolled the Prime Minister by 10 votes in a Cabinet room meeting on Monday night. Mm. I mean, pardon my ignorance here, Sandra, I want to get this absolutely right. Are uh, Mr Turnbull and Mr Abba both in the same party? Because they seem to have radically different views on how Australia <laughs> should be run, one being a Republican and the other one being so anti-Republican, he awarded the Duke of Edinburgh a knighthood, which may have started his demise. Yes, you're absolutely right. They are in the same party. They are very similar men, actually. They have both got private school backgrounds, which is your equivalent of public school over there. We call it a private school background here. Mm. They're both um, ex-journalists. They're One's a lawyer and one's sort of the prime minister has always been into public service. They're very similar in them in their makeup, but politically they couldn't be more different. They mm. are as different as chalk and cheese. It's incredible, and you're right. I think the beginning of the rot set in for the Prime Minister Tony Abbott when he did, um, you know, offer that knighthood, which even his most fiercest defenders here thought was absolutely ludicrous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's quite ridiculous that, that he did that, and that, and that started the, the tumble. Mr Turnbull, uh, on the other hand, has been incredibly successful in his private life, hasn't he? I mean, he first came to the attention of people in this country when he took on Mrs Thatcher and won, and Spycatcher, the famous, um, you know, uh, revelation of, uh, of uh, intelligence matters and all that was published in this country. But since then, he's, he's been a merchant banker and all sorts of things, hasn't he? Yes, he's tried his hand at a whole pile of things, and, and, and for the most part, he's been incredibly successful. Mm. He's a man of incredible self-confidence. I mean, you know, you have to say that Malcolm Turnbull has an ego the size of the Sydney Harbour. It mm. is just right. phenomenal. Yeah. There, there is no one who believes in Malcolm Turnbull more than Malcolm Turnbull. Yeah, I like people and I'd like say, that. You know, mm. Yeah, that, that's exactly what he's like. Yeah. But, um he has been successful in private business. He's been, um, you know, he wasn't as successful when he was the leader of the opposition right. several years ago, which was when he got booted by Tony Abbott by one vote. So it's kind mm. of a bit like sort of swings and roundabouts. They've, they've traded roles. Mm. Well, that's the thing. So what does Tony Abbott do now then? Is he going to kind of um, just sort of sit in the back, uh, a back room until he can get an opportunity to topple this guy again and take over? It seems to be a bit of a sort of uh, on-running feud. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of a bit of a feud. I don't think Tony Abbott will do that. The one thing that Tony Abbott um, treasures more than any is that one of the, the prized virtues he has is loyalty. And he said yesterday in his speech when he was leaving, um, not politics, he didn't say he was leaving politics, so we're nobody sure if he is going to resign from politics entirely. But he did say that he wouldn't be like the previous prime ministers, meaning Julia Gillard and Kevin Rudd, who were backstabbing each other mm. non-stop in right. the Labor Party for the job. He won't be doing any of that. He's a man of his word. And one of those things about loyalty to Australia, mm. more than anything else, is what he will sort of um, stand on, I think. And I reckon just about every Australian would put their hand up and say, yep, he's a man of his word. He won't do that. That's right. Whereas uh, Mr Turnbull lives in uh, Point Piper, which I think is the most exclusive um, you see, suburb, typical isn't of it? You, yeah, like, yeah, you, know, yeah. you love the yeah, idea yeah. that the guy is a successful <laughs> businessman. I do, yeah. You like that he yeah. lives in a trendy, expensive part Merchant of, banker. of, of yeah. the world. You know, yeah, you I like are so pathetic. Yeah. No, but, no, but pathetic. S Sandra, the, the, the... Man of the people, Sandra. No, the point I was going to make is, whilst, whilst Mr Turnbull's become incredibly rich and successful, I feel a bit sorry for Tony Abbott, because apparently his demise has come three days before he would have qualified for a pension and he's not going to get it now. <laughs> that seems a bit harsh. Yeah, no. Yeah. No, no, he will get his pension. Those rules are only um, for sort of the most recent lot of um, politicians who came in. But you're right, Mike, yeah. Mike Parry. Yeah. Um, Malcolm Turnbull does live in a $59 million harborside house. <laughs> now, he's one of the $59 That's million. Dollars. Yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> and he's going to have to downgrade when he goes to either the lodge in Canberra, which is yeah. the official um, prime ministerial residence, or whether he goes across the harbour to Kirribilli House, which yeah. is only worth a mere $13 million. I so see, basically, yeah. sounds he's a bit like the sort of, It sounds a bit like the Burlesconi of, uh, of Sydney, mm. doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs>
Well, I'm not sure about any of those. Um, what mm. are they called? The bunga bunga bunga. bunga yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, you have a bunga bunga party. But, but, is, but so, what does I mean? What does this mean? I mean, obviously, the big to- talking point at the moment in Europe has been the whole situation with the refugees. Mm. You know, borders being closed and all of that. Australia, famously over the years, has has had differing policies on immigration. Mm. Um, I don't know if they're wrapped up in this part part of the uh, uh, of the of the economic sort of migrant situation at the moment. But for the rest of the world, what is Australia's government now going to be like? Is it going to be more right wing? Less right wing? What? No, it will be less uh, right wing. It's not really right wing at all. It's it's mm. more conservative at the moment under Tony Abbott. I think Malcolm Turnbull. Everybody would agree that he's way more left than Tony Abbott. He's um, there's been so many stories about him. You know, in his older days when he was young, well, olden days, he'd even sort of considered running for the Labor Party. So, mm. well, with a fifty nine million dollar yes, mansion, I suppose he can afford to do whatever he likes, really. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> well, that's right. <laughs> I suppose he but, can. But yeah. he has said that he will he will maintain Australia strict policies of border protection and um, the policies on the boat people and illegal immigration. So Australia's mm. not under any pressure to accept any Syrian refugees, as, as, as most of Europe is? Well, no, because they have problems... I'm not asking you. I'm not asking you. I'm Sandra. Yes, Sandra on, so you can answer the questions. <laughs> Sandra, oh, sorry, yes, go no, ahead. We, we have accepted 12,000 um, Syrian refugees. The government, mm. uh, Prime Minister Abbott, the outgoing Prime Minister, well, he's outed now, he was. Um, he did announce a few weeks ago that we would take 12,000 um, Syrian refugees. And over the last two years since he's been in office, we've already taken 5,000 Syrian refugees. So we, we can put our hands on our hearts and say, you know, this nation is pretty compassionate when it comes to taking people who need to be taken in. Yeah, no, that's great. Now, Sandra, you may or may not know this, but about 18 months ago, I was the first person in the Western world, that is the northern hemisphere of the Western world, to identify <laughs> the iron ore so crisis. where exactly is the excuse Western, me, the Western hemisphere, me. north of no, the no. Northern no, hemisphere. No, the Northern Hemisphere. Western, well, where is world. that then? Is that like well, it's, you quartered the world? Now, no, 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 no. Because Sandra lives in the in the Western she world in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. She no, lives in the Eastern world. No, she lives in the Western world in the Southern Hemisphere. Just shut your mouth. How a minute, could she be you? in the Western world? Sandra, if she's on the, the other side of the globe. The, the, po- the point I was about to make to you was that I was the first person here to identify the iron ore crisis no, you in Australia. Yes, I was. No, you weren't. And I realised the first there was, person to read about it in the FT. Excuse, excuse me. I realised then there was going to be severe economic problems in that part of the world. I, I, I forecast the uh, demise of the Chinese economy, and I thought that Western Australia, centred around Perth and Monkey Mia and all that kind of stuff, would have problems with their iron ore exports. Now, I am told that it was Mr Abbott's inability to manage this shift in the Australian economy, which may have started or precipitated How long his is this downfall. question? I've just finished it. All right. I'm not sure what the question is, Sarge, are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm <laughs> I'm saying, can, can you answer it by fulsomely appreciating uh, Porky's amazing kind of yes. foresight on yes, this issue? Please. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, the Western Western Australia has had a massive fall in their exports with iron ore. Well, there and you that go. That has been one of the yeah one of the reasons that the West is pretty um, well was pretty cranky with Tony Abbott. And in fact, his foreign minister and his deputy Julie Bishop is mm. from the West, and she was the first one who put her hand up to backstab him this week. Right, right. So there you are. I think, aren't they, I think, aren't they um, replacing Mark, their you're right. aren't they replacing their iron ore experts with truffles though? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, that's all over the country in winter. We we do do a rip roaring trade on exporting truffles, mushrooms, oh, stinky amazing. stinky mushrooms. Yeah, that's uh, that's amazing. You ever had a truffle? Uh, no, I've never had a never truffle. Had truffle. No. Have you ever used truffle oil? No, no. I mean, they're very expensive, aren't they, these truffles? They oh, turn that's why up I thought at, you'd like them. They turn up at the Savoy Hotel in London and they charge like forty seven quid a plate for them or something right. like that. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I know. Well, uh, I mean, yeah, what? they've. They're a delicacy. They're very expensive, but they they are delicious. They're it's, fantastic. Yeah. But you have to have if you if you like really stinky blue cheeses, I yeah. reckon that you would like the truffle. That's where it's along that palate line. You have to have a really sort of you know robust palate to enjoy. He's not, it's not very adventurous. Well, well, it's a fish fingers and chips man you're talking to. I, I am actually. But what do they t- <laughs> what do they taste like, Sandra? What does a truffle taste like? Well, it's a mushroom, and it's just really a, a very pungent, strong taste. I right. love them actually. Oh, do you? But yeah. you do. Yeah, but you, but you do have to know how to cook them or to use them. Basically, you don't cook them, you shave them, so you, don't, you, you, you put them on top saying, of things. You say you don't boil them. You, you, the only thing you know how to cook is by boiling it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's... that's, that's yeah, but that's... Uh, don't take any notes in, Sandra. That's mostly cabbage, but you don't have cabbages in Australia, do you? Because it's too hot to grow them. Um, but anyway, and, and, anyway, getting back to uh, the truffles is very interesting and all that, but world affairs uh, remains... 
Are, is Australia now going to enter a period of political stability? Because, as, uh, as, as Mr Graham here pointed out, the only one fact he knew about this whole story was five prime ministers in five years. What's Four, the, actually. W- what's the hope for the future now? When's the next election? Well, the next election will be next year, and one assumes that the current Prime Minister will last until then. But whether or not the public come at him with absolute the metaphorical baseball bat for doing this, mm. the Liberal Conservative base that I've been listening to on Talkback Radio, like your, your shows, mm. are absolutely livid with him for doing this. Right. They're livid with the Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop, for doing, doing it. Yeah. So I, I, I would imagine that out there in sort of voter land, as sort of, you know, the chattering classes of the eastern suburbs and where Turnbull lives, yeah. That they will actually punish them, I would imagine, at the next election. The only the only thing he's got going for him is that the opposition is just, you know, incredibly a lot worse. Right, OK. Well, it all sounds fascinating stuff. Now, just before we let you go, yes. um, we were watching, bizarrely, and both of us were expressing quite uh, some... Uh, Amazement at the game that we were watching. Fremantle against the Sydney Swans, which yeah. I think is your team in Aussie rules. Yes. Um, how does it work, Australian rules football? It doesn't seem to have any rules at all. I <laughs> said like a true Englishman. Yeah. Mm. It's got rules, but you, but it's it's a fan, it's a fantastic game. And um, the fact that we went down to sort of the Dockers on the weekend was not very pleasing to anybody in Sydney. But we do have a second chance for the grand final this weekend in another preliminary final. You have to. It, it would take you know several bottles of wine to explain the rules to you both. Sure, sure. I wouldn't I just about, want just about, want, ten, about ten minutes then. For yeah, it, it, it would. How big is <laughs> how big is the uh, I'll ignore that. How big is the it's pitch? Because the, the pitch looks like she the said size. It would take too long to explain. We'll have to get the, her on and get her to do it spare another time. The pitch looks like the size of an airfield rather than a than a football field. Yeah, it's pretty big. And in fact, there's um, there's some research done that the average AFL player, Australian rules football player, runs about 22 kilometres per game. That's which amazing. Is, uh, you know. That's incredible, incredible, isn't yeah, it? I mean, incredibly incredibly seriously, incredible. an athletic You know what game. we should do? We should get you on again just to tell, talk us through the, exactly. the way it all works when Definitely. you get into the grand final. That would be great. Definitely. <laughs> I'd love to. It's great. We look Sandra. forward to it, Sandra. Thank a you delight. so much for a, your time tonight. A delight as ever. Thank it's you, Sandra. Nice pleasure. Yes, talk to you soon. It. Yeah. What a lovely girl she is. Beautiful girl. Uh, this is Talk Sport. We are the two bikes. This is Talk Sport. We are the two mics. Ask Porky coming up a little while. There'll be a, um, a podcast coming out a little bit later on, of course. A couple of tweets after your conversation about truffles there with Sandra. Mm. Uh, Rob says, Porky's had loads of truffles. Sherry truffle, fruit cocktail truffle, strawberry truffle. His favourite is bird's truffle. No, I agree with all that, yeah. I, um, he means trifle, obviously. He means trifle, but truffles are also chocolates that you get in a box, aren't they? Hey? Truffles are also chocolates you, can, you get well, in the yes, box. They, well, then you can get yeah, chocolate strawberry truffles, truffle yeah. and that yeah, kind of they, stuff. Yeah, but they're so. obviously not actually yeah. truffles. But I do remember... If you go uh, to Borough Market, they've got a whole truffle stall. Have they? And you can buy truffle oil, uh, you can try truffle... they smell pungent pate. or...? Yeah, it's, it's quite pungent. OK. I mean, it's, the, some, it's an acquired taste. I suppose a bit like caviar. Yeah. I remember when I was the news editor of The Express. Yeah, everybody and, does. And, and, and sometimes you'd get the uh, the expense accounts from the politicos, the guys oh, yeah. down in Parliament, yeah, you know. Yeah. And there was one guy who always had the most expensive ones. What was his name? Paul somebody? He had a black beard. Um, lived, lived in the West Country. I don't know. He'll give his name away. Yeah, yeah. You don't remember who he was. He ended up on television on Did a he? Channel 4 uh, Sunday morning political show. Really? What was his name? Paul somebody? I don't remember. Anyway, anyway the point is, he came in one time with this incredible uh, bill, you yeah. know, for lunch at the Commons. Right. Well, I know they're quite expensive and all that, but he wasn't at the Commons. Oh, no, it's all, it's all subsidised at the Commons. No, no. That's why a, they it, don't eat there. No, it was a restaurant in Westminster, yeah, yeah. OK? And, and I said, what on earth is this? And the guy he'd taken out was a very pompous MP, mm. you know, guy who really loved himself and thought he was, uh, you know, the most important man in Britain, who insisted on two plates of truffles. And they're so expensive, yeah. they're about £100 a in plate a or something like that. Are, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I've I never s- had them in a restaurant. Uh, oh, really? I've no, 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 I've no. never had them in a restaurant. And, and I said, why? I think, do you know what I think it was? I think it was rules in Covent Garden. Oh, yeah, OK. And, uh, yeah, they'd have them in there. Yeah, and I said, why did you... Uh, I normally have a steak kidney pudding with an oyster on it there. Oh, do you? Yeah. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah, good. Mm. And I've never had oysters, actually. I've never eaten oysters. You've never eaten no, oysters? No, 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 no. They're slimy, like fried eggs. I wouldn't eat one. 
So, um, so, so he said, "Oh, this is what the guy they do it as a, a power kick." Yes, I'll come out for lunch, you know, and they order the most expensive yeah. thing on the restaurant. Right. A bottle of wine, Very macho. A bottle of wine, even in those days, was mm. like eighty-five quid bottle yeah, of wine, ridiculous. you know, equivalent of about two hundred and fifty quid Shocking. these days. Yeah. Quite ridiculous. But you but passed them, presumably. You signed them. Well, you have to, because the guy's actually splashed out on yeah. it. You know, it wasn't like he was getting out his John Bull printing kit and yeah. his own expenses. Well, like I'd some of the... I'd certainly hope not. Some of the reporters did. Yeah. Norman Luck used to do that. Well, you don't have to name him. No, well, he's dead. Yeah, I know, but uh, it's yeah. an offence. Do you know how he died, by the way? Poor old Norm. He was, no. he was an old colleague. He, um, he was a DIY expert. Mm. But he uh, he fell in a hole that he dug. Did he? Yeah, he was planting something, oh, like a, a concrete pillar or something, mm. you know, to build a fence or something. Yeah. And he broke his leg. And so, normally speaking, a broken leg wouldn't cause you yeah. any, well, inconvenience, obviously, but no problem. But he was then, I think he'd just reached 70. Yeah. He'd been retired a few years. And uh, he got septicemia and died. Oh it's That's terrible, awful, isn't it? Shocking, shocking. He was he was as fit as a fiddle, Norm, mm. as well. But he was, Norm was the worst with expenses because he used to travel abroad a lot. He used to do a lot of overseas stories with his John Bull printing kit. Mm. And he'd spend the night before he came home, every time he was on a trip, um, you know, printing out uh, bogus receipts in order to um, embezzle well, the company, you which is what everybody did in those well, days. Well, I was going to say, obviously, he couldn't pass yeah. those, but, I mean, yeah. you know, once again, you've admitted to another crime by, by, no, 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 by no. being an enabler no, for people no. to fraudulently no. claim expenses. I wasn't an enabler One of these days, there's going to be a knock on your door, right? And it's no. not just going to be about the guy with the mm. scooter. Mm. It's going to be about all the horrendous crimes that you've committed no, no, all I, through I, your committed. life. I'll tell you the worst guy was. Don't tell no, us. No, 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 this is a great story. I won't name names, then, because I've got something I've got to do. Go on, then. still alive. Um, he was, uh, he worked on the, pi- <laughs> what are you laughing at? Well, you're giving away all these secrets no, 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 no. of Fleet Street. No, he worked on the picture desk, right? Yeah. And, uh, he'd been a photographer and he worked on the picture desk. Mm. And he had this double-breasted jacket and he used to open it up like this. Yeah. And there were 12 different coloured pens. Yeah. And he used to say to people in the pub, this is my fiddling kit. Because, you know, you need a load of different coloured pens to make up your own receipts yeah. and all that. You realise this is also a crime. Of course it's a crime, yeah. But get this. The man- you were party to it. No, you were, official, you no, were officially no, signing no. these expenses. No, no, because I became a victim of this guy who, who had his fiddling kit because what happened was the management, it was before my time, and right. the management became aware of this man's you know, ability to fiddle expenses. Multicoloured pencil so, set. So guess what they did? They made him managing editor in charge of expenses. Oh, well, I suppose Poacher Kirk turned uh, uh, gamekeeper. Uh, exactly. Mm. And from being, you know, the mass fiddler, he became the mass sort of, uh, um, what's the word, uh, Prosecutor yeah. of those who were fiddling their I'll expenses. I'll tell you the worst expensive story of all time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this was, I think, after you'd gone to the States. And right. There was a guy who mm. uh, was working as, I think, someone like the medical correspondent. Yeah. The, the story of him getting hired was hilarious in itself because he came in for an interview yeah. and um, was interviewed by the editor. Yeah. And then the news editor, who was your um, successor, yes. uh, had a word with him. And mm. uh, they also interviewed a couple of other candidates, right? Yeah. This guy was quite a high up reporter from one of the regional papers. Right. right? I'm not going to give his name away because mm. I don't know where he is now. No. Anyway, um, when this guy turned up for work the first day, yeah. um, you know, your free, your, your, the guy who took over from you mm. uh, went and introduced him to the editor and the editor shook his hand. And, and as he walked away, he said, uh, that's not the guy I interviewed. And they'd ended up hiring the wrong bloke, right? But yeah. as it turned out, he was quite good at his job. And the other guy who was the deputy editor, yes. who you'll know, yes. um, gave him some, you know, massive job to do, you know, like he used to give people special projects. Yes. And he had this great sort of um, exclusive, which mm. was splashed on the following week and all yeah, this. Yeah. And, and he got this note from said the deputy editor to yeah. say, you know, you've done really well, you know, take, your, take yourself and your wife out mm. for a nice, you know, Indian mm. meal or something mm. like that, right? Yeah. So the Indian guy, meal, yeah, so yeah. a nice Indian meal, nothing yeah. too extravagant, yeah, right? Which, right, which yeah. in those days would have been about 35 quid yeah, or so. Yeah, that's right, right? something like that, yeah. So the guy puts in, you to tear off those little th- bits at the bottom of the, uh, of the, of the receipt. Yes. You know, because you'd have the, the, the main sort of bill that would come and you'd that's tear right. off the bottom and put yeah. that in. Yeah. He put one in for unbelievably large amount of money. Like, he added a one or something. Yeah, 135. Stupid. So it went like in that. for 135. Yeah. But the yeah. mistake that he made yeah. was was so bizarre that you, you could never in a million years have guessed this would happen. Mm. He claimed to be entertaining some high-priced doctor yeah. who would have given him the story, right? <laughs> yeah. And I think the doctor was, in fact, a friend of the deputy editor. Right. And so when the, when the bill went through, mm. turns out that the guy that he claimed to be entertaining... Mm. Was actually having dinner at the deputy editor's house that night. Not nice, yeah. And oh, he was oh, busted. Me. And they had to fire him. Uh, th- they had really? to fire him. Really? Yeah. yeah. Good God! I'm, Isn't no, that incredible. Never, I never came across one like incredible that. Incredible story. I came across the one was uh, the crime uh, correspondent yeah. who uh, you know was a, a good guy, and so I used to give him a bit of uh, slack. But he came in with the famous um, uh, invoice, which literally said. 
um, he'd met a he'd met a copper in the mm. Albert Arms near right. Victoria Station, yeah. uh, which is which is <laughs> you're laughing about, which is near uh, Scotland Yard, yeah. New Scotland Yard. Well, I suppose you would be. Well, there. yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and and, and this receipt literally said um, uh, four large gin and tonics. Um, one bottle white, two bottles red, right. uh, two brandies, uh, three dram uh, one Southern Comfort, two cheese sandwiches. £178. Pounds, right. yeah? I mean, right. the, and the, the, the irony it never hit him that you know, this is a lunch bill which consisted of two cheese sandwiches and £170 pounds worth of booze. I know. Shocking. Now... I don't know whether we've got time to do this now, yep. because uh, you may not know that you were uh, nominated as one of the Clips of the Month oh, no, I didn't. on Hawksby and Jacobs Oh, I did, actually, because I sent a note out saying thank you, it was an honour. Yes. What, to be nominated? Yes. Yeah. Oh, no, well, no, no. You, you won it. Yeah, well, that's what I sent out today. Oh, so you did know about Somebody it? Somebody sent me a tweet saying you'd won it, and I wasn't sure what it meant, but all I said was, if I have been, that is a, truly an honour to, right. be, uh, to be the recipient well, of this award from Hawksby and Jacobs. Do you know what it was for? No, I don't. Would you like to hear it? Yes, I would. Well, yes. here is the winning Clip of the Month. OK. You know what that is, don't you? What's this? It's, it's, it's Mario's the clue. I was going to say that. Oh, this is Bob the Builder. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Well, Super Mario was the piece of music that we yes. were playing because we were about to talk about Mario Balotelli. Right, OK. And when I said to you, Mario's the clue, mm. you said Bob the Builder, which has got nothing to do with Super Mario. Is that right? OK. What was the Bob the... Uh, sorry, who was Mario then? Well, Super Mario was, you know, it was a game in one of the early kind of, you know, video games. Yeah, but the series. character Super Mario, what was he? What do you mean? Well, he was a, he was a guy that was in the game. Yeah, I know, but what was his profession? Well, he was a plumber or something. That's what I mean. Well, that's the same thing, isn't well, it? Well, Bob the Builder's not a plumber, is he? Well, he, well if you I, need bet, a plumber, I bet he could do a bit of plumbing, old Bob the Builder. No, if you need a plumber to come round yes. and a builder comes round, yes. then the, pl- and the builder isn't going to be able to do the plumbing work. They always have to have a plumber. So you should know this. Well, You're a guy that owns many properties. Well, Surely, no, if you no, need no. a plumber, you don't yeah. want a builder, do you? Well, sometimes they can do both. Well, that's a handyman. Um, sort of. I mean, I'm, I'm getting my... Uh... How's your uh, roof kind of coming on, by the way? It's not good. Have they found anything? Have you, have you listened to me about this yet? What? Have you not listened to me when what I said, about... you know, they shouldn't be pouring water in because it will make it worse? Yeah, well, you know, they've got to get on with it and do it, but it's not good. But no, at the moment, I'm having all the boiler systems uh, serviced. Which with, boilers? Well, all of the boilers that I own. And well, because, how many boilers do you own? Well, it doesn't matter. But what I'm well, saying roughly. is... No, 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 it doesn't matter. Well, well, I want to know roughly. No, no, what you should do is you should get your boilers serviced at this time of the year before it becomes winter because if you suddenly find out that it breaks down on the 1st of December, mm. you could wait up to three weeks to get it fixed. What, because there's not enough plumbers? Absolutely. We yeah. have a shortage of plumbers in this country. We have a shortage of lorry drivers. We have yeah. a shortage of people who do these sort of jobs. Yeah. That's why we've got to bring back technical colleges and polytechnics to get people to learn trades that we Well, you should know. You went to need. a polytechnic. Uh, I went to the University of the no, Trent. You went to no, not Nottingham that, Poly. Uh, you went to Nottingham debate. Poly. Why should you be ashamed of going to Nottingham I'm, I'm Poly? Not, I'm not. It was a fine institution. Yeah, I know. It but was. it's not called that anymore. So no, it's not. But no when you went there, it. but when you went there, that's what it was called. Well, what does that matter? I mean, you know, when when you were well, because surely you would when you say were, when you were a kid, you went to some kindergarten. But I bet it's not there anymore. So why would you why would you talk about? Oh, it? Well, because I wouldn't call it by the name that it is now known as. No, well, you don't know what it's known as because you don't keep in touch with. I went to say I went to St Edward's Primary School in Marylebone. Oh, really? What was yeah. that like? Uh, it was very good. My mother used to work there, so I oh, had really? special treatment in the kindergarten. In fact, they had a bike, in the, a trike in the, kinder, in the kindergarten, yeah. which I used to always get on before anybody else. What, favouritism? Yeah. Because your mother was there? Because was my she mother a teacher? Was, she was a teacher in the infants' class. Wow. Yeah. Golly, that's... Uh, but, you know, I was something. past... When mm. I was supposed mm. to go into her class... Mm. Um, she didn't want me. She didn't want to have me in the class because she said that wouldn't be fair on the other kids. No, I told you. I told so you. I, agree so, with I, that. so I jumped a year. Yeah. So I was like a child genius. So child I was a year. Genius. So I was Don't a year so, ahead. And because my birthday was in August, yeah. I was not only one year younger than almost everybody yeah. else. I was two years younger. What happened to the genius bit as you grow up? Oh, I think the drink destroyed it. Yeah, I think it did. Yeah, I'm sure it did. There's no genius about you now, pal. Believe well, me. Well, it's all comparative, really, isn't it? No, not really. No. Genius. Compared to you, I'm Einstein. Uh, no, 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 no. To, compared to me, you're Dumkoff. Who? Dumkoff. Who's that? It's a German word for a, a, a fool, a dope. It's not a person, though. No, no. not a person. It's a, it's, a, it's a type of person that mm. you are. You okay. know what I mean? We've got to ask Porky coming up in the next... As well as uh, a Schweinund. <laughs> in the next half hour. First we can do it in German. He only knows two words. If you love the Two Mics podcast, you'll love the live show. Weekday overnights from 1am on DAB Digital Radio and 1089 and 1053 AM and via the TalkSport app. TalkSport, your Premier League station with exclusive commentaries every weekend. What an absolute corker. 
Talk Sport. We are the two mics. There will, of course, be a podcast coming out a little bit later on this morning. Rob has tweeted at the two mics. He says, my mum lives on a mountain in Spain. Uh, her neighbour grows truffles and he has a dog that is trained to sniff them out. Yeah, uh, so I that's, guess you could that's, do that. That's what uh, dogs A lot of people are use to wild do. boars for that kind of thing. Yeah, they do, they? yeah. Uh, Woodenhead says, a man of Parry's class shouldn't worry about a hole in his ceiling. Having a swimming pool in your kitchen is very posh. Well, the problem is it's not in his kitchen, no, though, is it? I mean, it's, it's in the in the building, it's, it's, and nobody knows where the water's coming it's in. It's down the other end of the building, mm. and they, they've had construction workers there for two days now yeah. trying to sort it out. Yeah, not now, good. one here from Lou Jordan, oh, yeah. who is an Elvis impersonator, is he? who sends in this note with a picture of him and Joan Collins. Oh, and yeah. It clearly is Joan Collins. And he says, I've worked with Joan and know her well. I'll sort out a meet, Mr Parry, uh, for you and her. And uh, it's signed Lou. Well, she's, bound to to remi- she's bound to remember you, isn't she? Well, yeah, absolutely. And uh, and then somebody else has said, ah, oh, Porky, outdone by Elvis. Well, no, I have met her, and I tell you, I tell you where the picture was taken. Mm. I've met her a couple of times, actually. But um, were you around when Sir Nicholas had his 50th birthday party? Uh, you know, I think I was in America, perhaps. I think you probably were. Yeah. But anyway, he had about three parties. Right. One of them was at home in... Uh, he lived on that hill, what's it called? Yeah, in Belsize Park. Belsize Park, Hill, yeah. that's right, off Stock Hill. And, and we all had to get round there for a surprise party, mm. which his wife, uh, Eve Pollard, who is the mother of Claudia Wilk- Winkleman... Yes, who it said in one of the reports... There's a lot of names in this story so far. Well, in, in one, of the, one of the Tomorrow Morning's papers, it says that Claudia Wilkman is amongst a raft of BBC stars who get at least half a million quid a year. You oh, know. good for her. Yeah, absolutely. You would say, wouldn't you? I'm, I'm, or would I'm, you I'm, say that that's a waste of public funds? No, no, I would, I would say I love successful people. Good for her. Well done. Um, but anyway, look, the point of the story is... What so, is the point of the story? So Eve organises this party yeah. um, at their home, and we're all smuggled round there, and had to sort of hide oh, behind... Oh, surprise party? Yeah, seriously, hide behind it bushes. It a surprise party. Yeah, honestly. He must have known. No, we had to hide behind bushes in the back garden, yeah. and there was a balcony, I think, at the back of the house, and mm. we all had to sort of cower on a balcony. Yeah. And then Nick came into the kitchen, couldn't find him, but he walked out the back, and it was all, Surprise! <laughs> It's amazing the way you grovel to a man when he's the editor of your paper. You know well, what I mean? Well, it's, all that well, kind it's of amazing stuff. the way you grovel to him. No, I didn't grovel at all. Yeah, of course I was, you did. I was the only one who had... Sir Nicholas this no, Sir Nicholas no, that. No, I was the only one who had any dignity. Mind you, I, I don't was, believe that. I was the last to leave the party. He threw me well, out. Were you not the one who was then left behind and they didn't take you on to the meal that, later that evening? No, that was a, that was a Christmas party on ah, another occasion ah. when myself and, uh, and Craig yeah. um, were, at the, we were at the party at the same house and it was a New Year's Eve thing. And then suddenly... He got a call from somebody like um, who was the guy who ran the great PR agency. Oh, never mind him. You know, Lord, no, what's his yeah, name? Yeah, never mind. No, Lord you know what's what I'm talking about. I know you've yeah. got eight names already the guy, into the story. We the don't guy, want to give the guy, these names away. The guy who ran Sarchi and Sarchi, but it wasn't his, his name wasn't Sarchi. Yeah, I know the guy. You mean. Yeah. Tim Bell, you're talking about, aren't you? Tim Bell, that's right, Lord Bell. And 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 apparently, what and didn't he ring Bell Communications? Bell Pottinger. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he didn't uh, ring Sarchi and Sarchi. He came from Sarchi and Sarchi originally. Well, initially, maybe. Yeah, initially, yeah, yeah. He was a he was a copywriter there. But anyway, uh, point of my story is, is that he rang to say that he'd acquired a table in you know one of London's posh clubs or restaurants uh-huh. or something, and there were you know there were uh, uh, ten places at the table, and uh, were you lot coming along? So the numbers were counted up, hmm. and ten were nominated, but I wasn't one of them. <laughs> and I, I, of course, you weren't. No. And, and we were just left in the well, house. It's a similar kind of Piers Morgan situation, isn't it? We were just left in the house. Where you know they can't be, yeah. you know, they can't be certain how you're going to react after a certain amount of blood. Uh, that's, that's rubbish. That's rubbish. That's why but, you were not part of the inner circle. But anyway, 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 the other party mm. for Sir Nicholas was yeah. on the um, what was that uh, sort of area called outside the Express Building? You know, overlooking the oh, river. What, the terrace. The terrace. Yeah. yeah, it was on the terrace yes, overlooking the river. It was a terrace, river. in fact. It was a terrace. Yeah. yeah. And uh, very and nice. A, and a few celebs turned, including Joan Collins, mm. and of course I met her. Uh, Told her I thought she was a wonderful woman. She's a lovely great, woman, great British actress, and all this kind of stuff. Mm. And loved her in uh, Dynasty and yeah. and The Stud and all that kind of stuff. And we had an engaging the chat. Stud. The Stud was the film she was. You in. You said you liked her in The Stud. Yeah. And what was her reaction to that? She said it was great. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Asked her about. Uh, there was a lot of Rogerisation in that. There was Oliver On a Tobias. Swing, I seem to remember. Eh? There was a swing involved. There was a swing involved. And um, but anyway, we had our picture taken. And uh, so where is it? I've got it. I've got it. 
But I mean, I don't have to make public every picture that I've had taken. You've in my never life. made public oh, any picture, hey? You've never made any picture public no, that you're supposed I, to be with somebody famous. But anyway, look, that's point of story. Yeah, so never mind Joe that. Collins here. Now a few more of these. Come on, because people send them in. Yeah. Right. Um, fancy hearing on my favourite daily radio. Oh well, that's interesting. Considering I work here, it's not surprising. you No, see that's me. not. A t- that's not addressed to you. Oh, well, what's it's addressed that then? to Sandra. Oh, After Sandra was on it, somebody who knows her apparently, who by by happenstance was listening to this show because well, it doesn't he likes indicate to that at all. Well, it does because it says at fit to print, which is her Twitter address. No, it doesn't. Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah absolutely. See what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. You got to follow fine. the thread on these things. Yes. 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 Uh, right. It says here. Uh, this is addressed to you. Is she describing the Prime Ministers of Australia or you pair? Completely different views, huge ego, news editors and on a running feud. Well, I suppose that's quite a good story, really. Yeah, uh, quite a good question, really. I suppe- I suppose it would be, yeah. Now, then, We've well, never engaged in a running feud, though. Not really. No. Uh, now, Sandra herself says, Good morning, UK. Looking forward to chatting with my mates at two Why mics. are you reading that out? Uh, She's already been on. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was 47 minutes ago. You're a complete she, plank. She, she probably would have sent one since then, <laughs> saying how good it was to talk to us. Well, she might have done, but that's if what you read that one out, that would be helpful. That's what she normally does. I've okay. got a much more important mm-hmm. uh, story for you. Right, OK. It's on the front page of this morning's Daily Telegraph. Tell me. It says Britain could run out of diesel. Yeah. This is coming from the RAC. Now, do you know what is interesting about this? I filled my car up on Sunday yeah. down on the coast. Diesel is now cheaper than petrol again, I was about, isn't it? I was about to mm. say, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I looked up at the uh, the scoreboard there and it said... The that, scoreboard? You know, the uh, the one with the prices the on. Price, the price and, display. And if I've got this right in my head, mm. I think petrol was 112 and diesel was 111. Yeah. I mean, I've been Does to that a couple make sense? Of, yeah, I've been to a couple of places where it's 109, both the same. Right. But certainly a lot of places are now selling diesel for less money so than petrol. So why is this then? Now, according to the RAC, yeah. Britain has got too few refineries capable of producing diesel. Right. Yeah. Demand has grown by 76% over the past 20 years because so many more people have been driving diesel cars because yeah, 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 yeah. apparently it's more, uh, it's supposed to be more economical, yes. which I'm not sure that it was when, yes. that, when diesel was more expensive. Yes. And the RAC Foundation is predicting that by 2030, diesel will outsell petrol in service stations by four to one. Yes. So they're saying that we might actually run out because we haven't at the moment got enough refineries to produce enough diesel for the demand. But I also um, read in a Sunday newspaper business page oh, yeah. that some cities, I suppose London will be at the front of the mm. queue, are thinking of charging diesel drivers £25 a day congestion charge really? compared to £12.50 well, for petrol as, as, drivers. And, and, sort of, and sort of masking it as some kind of, uh, you yeah. know, saving the earth. Pollution uh, tax. Uh, type tax and all that. That's disgraceful. Whereas, well, as you quite rightly say, years ago we were all advised, oh, get yourself a diesel car because yeah. you get more miles to the gallon. And also it was Therefore, a lot cheaper. you're saving the planet. But also it was a lot cheaper. Well, the, the, the Chancellor in those days made it cheaper. He yeah. said, I'm going to discount diesel. Mm. So everybody starts driving around in diesel cars and you get 40 miles to the gallon, yeah. whereas you're only getting about 22 or 23 with petrol. I know. It's a contract, the whole damn thing. It is. And it, and it gets on my nerves. Now, when By the I... way, you're supposed to be getting a new car soon, aren't you? Yes, how's I that, am. How's that search going? Have oh, you... it's going well. It's going well. you told me you'd, just, you'd sort of decided on a particular model. Yes, I have, yes. Well, when are you getting it, then? Uh, first of November. First of November. First of November. Yeah. Oh, is that so you can get the uh, the special November plate? Yes, I think that's right. Yeah. Right. Now then, who was the first person in this studio? And there's two of us in the studio to recognise the fact that drones could be incredibly dangerous to the security yes, of this well, country. I've, who I've was the first? I've told you many times before that you did highlight the dangers, right. or the potential dangers right. of drones much before the newspaper... And what is the headline you're reading now in that newspaper in front of you? It says, MI5 brace for jihadi chemical attack on the UK. Thank you. But it is in the Daily Mail. Thank though. you. Uh, excuse me. And it's on page 21. Excuse me. Well, it's did, on page 21, right? Did it's I, not on the front of the paper. Did I not identify it first? No, hang on. It's not on page, it's not on page one, right? right? So they're obviously not that concerned about it. Uh, very let's, concerned. Let's, let's read the story and see. Yes. Uh, the threat is so serious that warning lights are activated in the intelligence centre every time yeah. heat-resistant glassware, chemical manufacturing equipment, or some everyday substances yep. that can be used to produce weapons are bought on eBay or Amazon, yes. the security source has revealed. Mm. This is just one of those scare stories. Well, I don't think it is. I yes. think the possibility is of, on page a, then? of a drone flying over any congested area and dropping a bomb yeah, yeah. on the people yeah, below is very real. You've said all that before. Well, well that proves that it's real. But we've already said that Downing Street and other security mm. Uh, mm. Uh, uh, sort of sensitive areas yeah. have already worked out how to deal with it. They're going to they're going to have you know do, ways of down. yeah they're going to have ways of shooting them down if necessary. They're yeah. going to have no fly zones yeah. for well, drones. Well, I'll tell so you I what. Is any reason 
There's no reason for you to do anything. Uh, I tell you what, they're, go- they're going to have to have very efficient radar scanners. Well, they will have. Millions of them. They will have. They're going to have to have very efficient uh, armaments, yeah. like every building will have to have a gun on top. Well, you maybe know. they already have. And, uh, and, and to shoot these things down mm. would be a full-time job. Because if you think about it, something like there are something like... I don't know. I don't know why he's so obsessed with this. Uh, there are something like 8,000 um, uh, aeroplanes pass in and out or over the Heathrow you know, area every day, yeah. right? And they all have to be tracked one by one. Hmm. If the drone gets going, that could, multiply, that could multiply by 10. There could be 80,000 drones <laughs> flying... <laughs> what are you laughing at? Flying over London at the same time. Yeah, maybe. Maybe we'll all well, get hit by a meteor and die a horrible death. Well, funny you should say that. Funny you should say that. I was reading a book over the weekend which predicts that within the next 20 years, mm. a meteor is going to hit the earth and really? wipe us out. Who no, I'm serious. That, Who's written that? I'm serious. Who's written that? The book is called... It's called... Hang on, because I wrote it down here. Doomsday. I've read it right. Hey? Doomsday. It's called Magicians of the Gods. <laughs> I don't know what you're laughing at. And that it sounds like a right riveting it's, tone. Uh, it's written by Graham Hancock. Oh, yeah? Is it Pu- a novel? But no, it's published by Coronet, and it says Who? here... Well, you say Coronet like it's some kind of Simon and Schuster offshoot. Is a comet about to destroy Earth? Is that a question? Within the next 20 years, Earth faces a, catastro- a catastrophe... A, th- <laughs> a catastrophe a thousand times worse than the detonation of every nuclear weapon oh, on the planet. Really? It will be a collision well, with no the remnants. You won't be worried about how, how, whether you get your hands on any diesel, then, it, will you? It will be a collision with the remnants of a comet big enough to end all life as we know it. Render all life as we know it what? It, it, it'll wipe out all life as we know it. Oh, oh well. Something to look forward to, then. Be dinosauric. Yeah, dinosauric. A catastrophe coming. Beware. This is Talk Sport. <laughs> Now, this is a very, um, I would say, astute musical selection right. of what you're about to talk about. It's Led Zeppelin, obviously. You know yes. what it's called? That was called... That's not Stairway to Heaven, is it's it? It's not Stairway to Heaven. No. It's on the same album, though. It is on the same album. So you've got, the, same, uh, you've got yeah. the right uh, era. No, you better tell me. Black Dog is the name. Black that. Dog, is yeah. that right? Yeah. Because well, you know, you know Black that Black Dog is. Well, Black Dog is a, a depression, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. People and, talk and, about and the Black Dog coming to visit. That's right. And you know Amy Winehouse's um, debut LP, which made her a worldwide star, yeah. which was called Back to Black. It was. Everybody thought that was a reference to the fact that she sings like a black person with a, a you know, no, sort of voice and all that. No, in, fa- in fact, it meant well, Back to Black. one of the songs on the album. Yeah, exactly. And it was about going back to depression yeah. when everything else failed in life. Yeah, exactly. Which was... Uh, odd. And, and Winston Churchill used to call it the black dog as That's well. Right. He yeah. used to get terrible depression sometimes. That's why he uh, he drank uh, brandy for breakfast. Mm. Now then, what I want to tell you about, what yeah, I want to tell you about yeah, is that um, the new way of um, of finding a partner in life is to do it through your dog. Yeah. There's a, there's a website... Well, you know, there are men... Uh, who yeah. in the past have admitted to buying a puppy? Yeah, because if you walk into the street with a puppy, yes. immediately women will you know flock to the puppy. Oh, exactly, and that's how you will somehow you know lure them uh, 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 into uh, absolutely sordid exercises. Ab- absolutely, and if you're walking that puppy around somewhere like Central Park in New York, mm. where there are literally hundreds of women walking yeah. their dogs at the same time, yeah. that is a, a conversation. Well, maker. in New York City, still, I believe it's correct to say that the women outnumber the men by about four to one. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good place to be. Yeah. Well, it is, maybe, if you're interested in that sort of thing, which, which you're not, are you? Well, you know. Or are you now back interested again? Well, I've never been uninterested. Well, I thought you said the search for the first Mrs. Parry was over. No, 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 no. It's just that with the old um, tricky ticker, yeah. the dicky ticker, yeah. you have to be a little bit careful about yeah. your ambitions in the sort of... Um, physical pursuit world. Yes. Let's put it that way. Indeed. Now then, what I was going to say is, there mm. is a website called uh, tindog.co. And, uh, what... Tindog? Tindog. I like Tinder. Well, I suppose. T-I-N-D-O-G dot That's what I mean, but it's a play on Tinder, isn't it? Tinder. Tinder is that website where people go on to meet each other for oh, is it? I didn't know that. purposes. Oh, is that right? Yeah, oh, I know that. No, I didn't know that, no. Mm. But anyway, this is called Tindog.co. Um, yeah. And what you do is you, um, you know, you have a look at it and see what, you know. Um, here we go. One guy got onto it, looking at some case examples here. Mm. Um, uh Usually I would not start a date by grabbing a lead and shouting walkies at my West Highland Terrier Matilda or hanging around a park desperately trying to recognise a dog and his owner. I've only ever seen a picture. And yet there I was, a perfectly sensible 41-year-old single mother. This is a woman's personal account, OK? Uh-huh. Right. Standing in the rain in Richmond Park, south-west London, scouring the horizon for Will and his dog Oscar. Oh, yeah. Will and his dog Oscar had been on the tindog.co site mm. and looking to meet... 
people who were the same thinking sort of people. Like-minded. Well, I mean, I suppose it doesn't uh, surprise, there was any great surprise to anybody that if you're a dog owner, yeah. then you're more likely to get on with somebody who likes dogs yeah. than you are to get on with somebody who doesn't like it's, dogs. It says, uh, Tin Dog, a new dating app mm. aimed at singleton dog lovers, yeah. works in a similar way to famous swiping dating app Tinder, which yeah. you've just mentioned. Yeah, right. You scroll through pictures of dogs and their owners until you see one you like. Right. If two people like each other's pictures, they're put in touch. Mm. Uh, never had I done this sort of thing before. It's internet dating but with a dog involved and the idea of tin dog scared and interested me until i went out and tried it and found it actually very comforting yeah so there you go well i mean there's lots of people out there now mm. who would be using you know various dating apps and, and yep. you know online dating sites which which 10 years ago maybe they wouldn't have done there's many mm. more people now than, than than ever i think would now admit to doing it and have admit you, to have using you ever, it yeah i mean you've got your dog now right you've yeah got, uh, you've got the little dog and beautiful the dog, dog that you keep tweeting yeah that's you tweet right, him yeah. again at the weekend when yeah, he's well, in the well if the dog tweets out i think it yeah, but he can't tweet response. you back i keep telling yeah, you i know that. that but somebody obviously is doing it for him well, now uh that. now do, have you ever met um somebody walking their well, dog I'll tell you, one of the things that does happen yes. is that you do tend to meet people with dogs when you're out walking other you know your dog naturally and quite often if you're in a place where you do you do the the, the i mean there's a part of you know the, the the sort of the local, shall we say, fields where I walk right. with the dog right. around the house, and you tend to meet the same people. Some of them are guys, some of them are women. Yes, um, and it would be very easy to strike up a sort of you know friendship, shall we say, mm -hmm. with with women walking dogs. Because well, how do you know that they're not in get you know sort of involved in a relationship in life anyway? Well, because they normally volunteer it. I mean, normally if you start talking yeah. and you sort of dogs are running about, having a laugh, mm. and, and you know you're both admiring, you know how much yes. fun the dogs are having. Yes. You find yourself having a conversation. Yes, I mean, I mean I've had a few conversations with women who have then told me that, oh, my boyfriend does this or he does that or he normally walks a dog, but, you know, he's, he's lazy and, you know... It's just always yeah, but you'd only be interested in a woman who said, oh, I haven't got a boyfriend. Um, well, I'm not saying that. I'm not interested in any woman necessarily for that purpose. I mean, that's not the point. But, well, I mean, you, if I was, is yes, what I'm saying, yes. you could very easily move the, song, the conversation on. I see. To, well, how about next uh, next Sunday? I'm going to be here around mm. about 10 o'clock. Mm. You know, why don't you bring your dog out and, you know, we can have a bit of a laugh Didn't and a shout. did you tell me you met some weirdo woman recently in a field or well, something? Well, I wouldn't say weirdo. What, what was that? No, I wouldn't say weirdo. There was a funny, enough, there was a, um, there was a Keen concert on. Um, in uh, the Keen. place Keen, you remember the band Keen? No, you don't remember the band Keen? No, somewhere I don't really. only we know that no, song. He no. was on the breakfast show. The guy, oh really? Tom Chaplin was he? Okay, yeah, yeah. all right. Mr. Brazil invited him out for a drink afterwards. Oh, okay. Uh, and forgetting that he did actually been cut, he was an alcoholic and wasn't allowed to go for a drink. <laughs> oh, right, but anyway, okay. that's another yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, there mm -hmm. was a Keen concert on, and I was walking a dog, mm -hmm. and it was coming near dusk, and yeah. I saw, and it was during the time when they, you know, they, they, they. Um, they sort of make all the hay bales into big round sort of things and put plastic around right. them. You know, like those Constable Haywain pictures. Yes. Except now with plastic wraps around them. And she was, there was I, I was vaguely aware in the distance of yes. another dog. And whenever, you see, whenever I see another dog, because my dog's still a little bit sort of frisky, mm. Mm. Um, I'm always, I'm careful. I put him on a lead and yep. make sure that, you know, he doesn't get caught up. Anyway, so um, I saw this figure sitting on one of these bales. Yes, yeah, so I, I know what you mean. These big things yeah. wrapped in black plastic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Waiting for collection. And, uh, and basically, mm. um, as I and got nearer and nearer, you know, we started kind of shouting at each other about the dog. And, mm. and, and, and she said something like, oh, don't worry, he's fine. Uh, you know, he's very friendly mm. talking about her dog. And I said, well, in that case, I'm just going to let mine off the leash. What she sort said, of dog Fine. was hers? Hers was a bit smaller. He was like a sort of little terrier or okay, something like yeah. that, or a beagle, yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. Anyway, so the dogs then spent quite a bit of time running after each other in this field. Mm. I then quite saw Quite playfully, yeah. Very playfully, yeah, because yeah. my dog's very playful. Yeah. And so was hers, as it turned out. Then mm. I noticed that she had a, a child with her as well, a right. kid who had very long hair, right. um, who was her son. Um, so that's we a just bit weird, sort isn't of it? struck up this conversation. Little boy with very long hair. Well, not well, I always think that's a bit weird. Well, I mean, she maybe was a bit bohemian or something. Yeah, bohemian. And then, yeah. And then um, I noticed that she had a glass of wine in her hand, right. and she was sitting in this in, on this, you know, stack with this glass of wine. And we it's got, quite difficult to get on one of those stacks, you know, because they're, they're quite, quite big. they are quite high. Yeah. yeah. Um, but she'd managed it anyway. She then pr just proceeded. We proceeded to have this kind of conversation. Yes. Um, which was quite unusual, I would say, for two people who've only just met. Well, I'd I would say in the middle bit, of a uh, field, one with a wine glass, was yeah. there a wine bottle around? As she well? had, I think she had a bottle there as well. Yeah. And she told me that she was there nearly. I've never seen her since. Right. Right. She said she was there nearly every night. Uh, what? Well, sitting on a hay bale drinking wine. Time. Yeah. And she obviously lived somewhere nearby, mm. but she didn't tell me where she lived. Um, and we had this sort of quite interesting conversation, yeah. quite flirtatious conversation, I would say. Flirtatious. Um, and Ooh. she asked me if I was going to the Keen concert and if I wanted to go to the Keen right. concert. And I just kind of said, well, no, I've got to get home. Blah, blah, blah. Yes, yes. But so anyway, my point is... is that so she was coming on to you then? Well, possibly. 
Possibly. Possibly. I, mean, Possibly. I, wasn't, I wasn't prepared to, to go further than yeah. I had gone. So, yeah, you know, yeah. I didn't want to necessarily, get, you know, get myself yeah, into trouble. So, yeah. so I just went yeah. home. But, yeah. you know, what I'm saying is is that when you go out with a dog, you mm. can find yourself in those kind of situations. Yes, of course Sometimes you can, you have to yeah. be careful. It is an icebreaker, is it not? Well, I think so, yeah. yeah. And but a lot of men do it deliberately. They take a dog out, sometimes yeah. somebody else's dog, yeah. and pretend it's their dog. Really? Uh, in order to sort of, uh, well, you know, gain that. some kind Maybe of Maybe I'll advantage. come down to your part of the world and borrow your dog. Because unlike you, I'm allowed to sort of be flirtatious I'm not sh- with uh, I'm not single sure, women. I'm not sure you'd want to do that. Why? He might pull you over. No, He's very no, no. strong. Don't be ridiculous. Don't be ridiculous. I told you I had a girlfriend once had a black Labrador, and the Labrador absolutely adored me. Mm. There's something about me, something about the messages I give off. Dogs really there like. There is something about you, yeah. No, there is. No, do, you there is. To, do you want to hear a bit of that Keen song? No, not really. Don't you? I've never heard it. It might remind you of well, what Well, go on, that's a rather nice song, that. Yeah, it is. Did that get to number one? Well, I think it did, yeah. Did it? Yeah, yeah. very nice. And Keen, a big, big band? Big band from Sussex. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I mean, could they uh, perform in America? Um, I don't think they ever cracked America. No, OK. But they were big here. I've read a story yes, last no, week. No, about tell a... me about that. You've got to see the time. Look at the time. No, no, it's good. No, no I'll just tell you very, very quickly. It's good. Some some guy used to describe himself as a bush and hide in the bushes to jump on dogs that were uh, fouling the pavement. Oh, dear. Yeah. Anyway, listen, it's Ask Porky coming up next. Of course it is, hope yeah. I you, hope you're ready. Yeah, let's get into it. apologise if we don't get to yours, uh, but what we do sometimes try and do is yeah. keep the best ones and hang them over to the following week and they uh, maybe mm-hmm. get into the mix again. So shall we get on with it? Because uh, we've got a lot to get through, and I'll ask yeah, you to be on. as brief as you can okay. uh, in as much as you can be helpful as well. OK. Um, here's one uh, from Rich, who says this. Porky, if you had one day left to live, mm. what would you cram into it? If I had one day left to live? Mm. Well, if there was one day left to live, I'd try to help others in the world who were more panic stricken about the end of the world than me. Okay, because right. I'm very. Well, I'm not saying I don't think you're saying it's the end of the world. I think yeah. you're saying that if you personally. Oh, if I had day. personally one day to live, yeah, I'd go into the pub and get bladdered. Right, because just like every other day, then. Sorry, just like every no, other day. No, not like then. every other day. But I'd want <laughs> I'd want uh, good food, good drink. Good company mm. and uh, my favourite TV show for about uh, an hour or two. Okay. So I'd want to catch up on all the uh, episodes of Coronation Street I hadn't seen. Okay, mm. and then I would I would disappear into the next world uh, on a wave of uh, perpetual um, mirth. Excellent. To use George Harrison's word. Indeed. Now this one from Frazzle. With your economics expertise, which country would be the next to unexpectedly emerge as a global tiger economy? Global tiger economy, the next one, we already know about India, China, Brazil. I reckon the, glo- the next global um, uh, Celtic tiger type thing, because that's happening again in Ireland at the moment, you know. Mm. They've revived their economy. They've got over that terrible recession, which nearly put them into bankruptcy, and they're now firing on all cylinders again. But without a shadow of a doubt, in my mind, the next great global power in terms of output mm. will probably be Vietnam. Really? Yes. OK. Yes. Well, you remember you heard it here first, if it yes. says that to be true. Tex says, have you ever eaten at a Little Chef? And if so, what did you have? Yes, I've eaten at a Little Chef a lot of times, but I don't think Little Chef exists anymore. I think it's I closed think down. I they've done away with, haven't they? They've been done away with, or they've merged with... Um... Because they lost out because of all the kind of uh, expansion yeah, of... Yeah, all the of, fast food uh, takeaway joints. Not just fast joints. food, but also of the service stops. Uh, yes. And, and also the garages that have now turned That's into right. food outlets. Right? Yeah, I used to stop at them. I used to have the full English breakfast minus the fried eggs. because I don't eat eggs. So I'd always ask for a double sausage. So yeah. I'd have sausage, bacon, uh, black pudding, uh, tomatoes, fried bread... Mushrooms, but no, uh, no egg. Just okay. a double sausage. Doesn't sound very healthy. Though. No, it's brilliant. I once went to one uh, with my kids mm. one morning, and they'd run out of eggs. Right. And I went, how can you have run out of eggs? Yeah, well, that sounds You're strange to a little chef. It's no wonder they went out of business. Well, another reason why they closed down was mm. because people got bigger and fatter and couldn't fit into the tables anymore because the tables were static. Really? You, you couldn't pull a chair up or anything like that. They're right. all they're all uh, screwed to the ground. All right. So when big well, fat those in people. Booths, right? Sorry? In boots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when big fat people started uh, getting bigger and fatter, yeah. they, the restaurants became too small for, uh, for the jumbo-sized uh, clientele. All oh, right. Mm. Uh, now, a couple here that are on related subjects to okay. do with the Rugby World Cup, yes, which, of course, yes. gets underway at the end of this week. Uh, Freddie says, mm. will Mr Parry be taking time off from the show to cover the Rugby World Cup? Mm. About time he caught up with Campo. Uh, yeah. And Jacques uh, says, will England win the Rugby World Cup yeah. 2015? Yeah. And what players do we need to look out for during the tournament? Yeah. Well, um, the answer to the first one is no, I haven't got time, I'm sorry, to cover the World Cup on this occasion. In 2007, of course, I was the talk sport yeah. rugby uh, uh, That was union, amazing, wasn't it? Uh, World Cup correspondent. England got to the, uh, to the final, even though they weren't a fancy team. And, uh, and I lost. Met, I met some of the people in the squad a few times. I think I, I, I provided a, an inspirational role. As for the second question about who we've got to watch out for this, this time, well, I would say this. 
the answer to that one is everybody. Yeah. You know, you can't you can't say this well, guy, that well, guy. We may be this looking country, into the country. rugby world cup everybody, in a bit more in a bit more, in a bit more detail. Everybody's a threat. Yeah. Everybody's a threat. Anybody who has ever held an egg shaped ball who is um, uh, pitching up in uh, Britain mm. to play this is a, is a threat, including the French who are in Croydon, yeah. which is not very far away from me in Stockbroker Belt, Surrey. Yeah. But they're whinging about the state of the hotel and yeah, the training facilities because they think Croydon's a bit of a dump. Well, it's a bit of an odd place to pick. Isn't well, it? Croydon is a dump. That's the problem. Yeah. And uh, there's very not much, there's not what you can say about that. Yeah. Even though I don't want to be harsh on the people of Croydon, <laughs> um, it, it is well, it, it, it is not it wouldn't be most people's favourite town. All I can say is concrete is we, jungle. It is yeah that we may expand mm. a little bit more on the World Cup as yep. it gets closer. Yeah. Towards the end of the week. Yeah. Here's one from Neil. Uh, it says, Dear Porky, would you describe yourself as a man who lives to work or a man who works to live? Uh, I would say that um, when you have talent in the world, you have to share that talent with other people. I'm not saying that I'm particularly over-talented, but, I mean, people like, you know... Elton John and people like that share their talent with the world. Mm. I feel I have the same responsibility. That means that uh, my work is not for myself and for my own self-satisfaction. It is to try and bring joy and pleasure to the rest of the world. That is an obligation I feel as a member of mankind, and that's why I do it. I didn't know you were a member of mankind. Yes. Um, is that like Manfred Mann? No, no, don't be, don't here's be ridiculous. One from, uh, here's one from Becky. Uh, Mike, my football team have gone from champions to chumps, mm. even lost to Everton. Should I support Manchester City instead? No, you can only support the team that you're born and brought up with. The point is that um, when you are devoted and close to a team, you have to take the attitude that you didn't choose to support that team, you became a chosen one. I.e., i.e., you migrated towards you're one that of those club. that says your team chooses you. Exactly, your team chooses you. Mm. And in my case, I'm a third generation Evertonian, therefore, there was never a question of who I was going to support. It just became part of my life, as did, you know, Christianity, as did red blood in my veins. You even red though, bull there for a minute. No, no, even though I'm, uh, uh, you know, a supporter of a, a blue team. And uh, it, it was just a matter of course. And that should be the way that most people inherit their support and love of their team. All right. Uh, Jim says, uh, what is 58 out of 100 as a percentage? Well, we all know well, that. that's 58%, isn't it? Well and that's, done. that's a ridiculous uh, reference the other night to a well, throwaway it's question. Well, a chance to get, one, get it right. A throwaway question. Well, I got it right the other night. It was yeah. just it was a, it was a delayed uh, response okay. answer. Steve says, uh, what would you suggest I serve with my white lamb, spinach and gravy or sweet corn and mushy peas? Yeah, well, again, you see, this is somebody trying to take the mickey. Why? Also, well, Straight question about I don't, food. I don't, I don't know what, uh, what other colour you would describe a joint of lamb, skin colour or something like that, <laughs> but... <laughs> Well, I don't know what you're laughing at, because it is skin colour. That's What that's... skin? Well, lamb, lamb skin, skin, you fool, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, for you to try and take the mickey and say, did it still have wool on it, was actually a pathetic comment. Well, you uh, said it was white. Comment. Pathetic. No. Uh, now, here's one from Ben. My wife has just taken on a new team at work. Should she threaten redundancy on Christmas Eve to raise morale? Um, I'm not quite sure what that question means. Really. If she's ahead of the team, then she's got to be inspirational and lead from the front. That's what I've always done. If there was blame to be she taken... She might want to put them on their uh, toes, though. If there really? was blame to be taken, I would always step forward and take the blame. Mm. If there was leadership necessary... I've always step, done that. I would, yes, I would step forward and lead from the front. Mm. If inspiration was needed, I would inspire. And if the rallying to the flag and the and the sheer bravery and courage to see us through hard times was necessary, I'd do that as well. I was, in fact, a perfect leader. I never, I never yielded or balked at anything. to believe, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Jonathan says this, if you had a chance to pilot a Spitfire, a Hurricane or a Lancaster, yeah. which would you have been better flying? It would be a Spitfire. Mm. Um, when sometimes you uh, answer these quizzes about, uh, you know, if you could have a time machine and go back in time, where would you go? Uh, my only wish would be to go back to 1940 Battle of Britain. I would love to have been a Spitfire That'd pilot. That would be my wish as well. Uh, and I'll send I, you back in the uh, time uh, machine. Uh, uh, and, and I would not uh, worry at all about my life. I was fighting for my country. I would take it as an honour to get into one of those Spitfires at 20 years of age and fly up into the skies and shoot down the Hun. I don't think you can say that anymore. Well, of course you can, because that's what they're known as in 1940. Yeah, OK. Uh, now, here's one from Colin, who says, I'm going to New York in December. Where is the best place to buy a leather coat uh, for a great price? Uh, I'd go to uh, Brooklyn and uh, see all those Polish tailors who make a living over in Brooklyn. And uh, I went over there once and got a sheepskin coat made. Yeah. But you, there's plenty of places we can get leather coats really? made. That's the Mind answer. You, Brooklyn's very trendy now. In fact, some parts of yeah. Brooklyn are more expensive than Manhattan, so maybe they're not right? there anymore. Uh, here's mm. one from Steve. The Daily Express reliably claims we'll be up to our necks in snow soon. Should I bulk buy salt now while it's cheap? 
Um, no, if I were you, I would make provisions for having the proper clothing. So, for instance, talking about New York, when we were there, um, our old colleague, Philip Finn, who mm. sadly is not with us anymore, no. rest in peace, Philip, you're a great guy, um, he, uh, he uh, advised me uh, in my first winter there to buy galoshes to put over your shoes. Yeah, that is a good idea, actually. Because if you buy a £200 pair of hand-stitched leather shoes, yeah. which is the sort of thing we used to do in uh, in New York, because mm. we were quite uh, affluent, um, they would rot in the uh, the slush and the... And, and the snow, yeah, uh, And true. the snow and the salt. So you buy galoshes and put them over your shoes when you yeah. went out. Right. Now, here's one from Paul. Yes. Uh, Paul, if rat-like cunning was an academic subject, what level of qualification would you hold? Oh, I'd have got an A triple, uh, triple gold star. Mm. A triple gold star, because the, the, of all the virtues... That you need in life to get on. Rat-like cunning is one of them. And rat-like cunning is all about saying one thing that's coming out of your mouth, but thinking something completely different in your mind. Yeah. So, for instance, when you're agreeing with somebody who's telling you something you think is a load of baloney, yeah. you are plotting at the same time with your brain to discredit and turn that person over as quickly as possible. Right, OK. Yes. Uh, Rodney says this, uh, mm. I'm expecting mm. my second child in November. What should yes. I name him or her? Uh, if it's a, a boy, I would name him something exotic like Nathaniel. Okay. Or, uh, That's a nice name. Or, or Basil. Or, I like Nathaniel. Uh, yeah, actually. Nathaniel, yeah, something like that. Nat for sure. Yeah, Nat for sure. And if it's a lady, I would name her something very feminine like uh, Poppy. Or Wendy, Poppy. or Trudy. Something with a Y on the end. Something like that, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, you can't say fairer than that. Yeah. Uh, here's one from uh, uh, Lee, who says, I've noticed my wife drinking wine and eating liver pate for breakfast. Does she have yes. a problem? No, she's got a, a very good idea in life. Um, a glass of red wine uh, to fortify yourself over breakfast is not a crime in this uh, country. As long as you're not having to go to work. Well, you know, on days when you're not working, pubs now open everywhere in Britain at 9am. Mm. And mostly that is to serve uh, breakfast, but... Uh, a lot of them serve alcohol from 9am. So there's nothing wrong with a, you know, a I glass know. of fortified red wine and a, a, a sausage sandwich. Nothing wrong at all. OK. Uh, now, finally, from Hugh, who yeah. uh, says, uh, after tonight's results, the Premier League's quality versus the rest of Europe, we are kidding ourselves if we think we are the best, aren't we? Uh, yeah, I think we are, actually, uh, particularly at this time. But the one thing we've got to find out is why the um, the, the commitment and, and the success that we, or, or some of the teams enjoying the Premier League, cannot be uh, translated into European competition. Mm. I just don't get it. Mm. And somebody's got to find out. I think Mr Pellegrini has got so many questions to answer because he's never going to be accepted as a terrific European coach when he fails miserably at the first hurdle, even with the best and most outstanding Premier League record behind him that he, that anybody's had for years. And just as we uh, are talking about yeah. that, here's uh, Sevilla on the TV just scoring their second goal. Exactly, so, uh, Sevilla, famous for oranges. Yeah, very, very good football team as well. They will be my dark horse recommendation for the Champions League, by the, the way. A load of rubbish. Well, well, you'll see about what that. Nonsense. You will see about that. They Honestly. could actually victimise an drinking. English Premier League team no. and go through uh, in space of them. Uh, anyway, that was Ask Porky uh, for one more session. Same time next week, of course, we'll be doing it. Coming up tomorrow night's Porky Vision uh, and then the... The uh, quiz on Thursday night, the Porky quiz, will be on the Battle of Britain. Yes. Uh, we've got lots more to do. The two mics, there will be a podcast coming out a little bit later on uh, this morning, of course. We've got a little bit more to do on this show. Kenny uh, has sent a picture of a new number plate for you, for you two, uh, oh, for yes. your new car. That's uh, it's spelled out P-L-A-N-K. Oh, I see. So, and un- and yes. underneath the two mics. Uh, another another seriously um, uh, specific comment well, on my lifestyle. It huh? says, hurry up, Porky, your new plate is ready for the oh, new no, Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, we'll like a laugh on this show. No problem about uh, that. Here's one from Owen who says, uh, NASA have said we won't be hit by a meteor for hundreds of years yet. Porky's got that wrong. No, no. Uh, And then... I've got the book um, from the expert. uh, Dazza says the meteorite would be big enough to blow the dust out of the space between Porky's ears. That's a bit harsh. Hashtag catastrophe. A little bit harsh, Mm. in my view. And then somebody sent in... uh, uh, I know this is not true, because I know you wouldn't actually buy these. Porky loves a bargain. I caught him in Tesco last weekend purchasing these, and it's those cartons of uh, wine. Have you ever tried those, by the way? Well, no, but years and years ago... used to do wine boxes years ago. I was was about to say, years and years ago, in fact, when we were all young reporters on the Express in London... You know, believe it or not, you could buy like a cottage down in uh, Isha then for yeah. about 120 grand or something. Really? No, actually, much Probably cheaper less than, than that. that. I was about to say about 65 no, grand. No, when I bought my. Well, yeah. actually, I mean, even even yeah. as recently as I would say, what, the mid to late 90s? Yeah, yeah. First house I bought in Wiltshire, which mm. wasn't very big, yeah. I admit. But it was a it was a sort of semi detached cottage yeah, or something. Yeah. It was about sixty thousand. Yeah, well there you go. You could buy them down in in Wiltshire, uh, sorry, in uh, Isha, which is now like multi millionaire property. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember Colin Bell had a cottage down there, mm. right? 
Um, we used to go down there. Not uh, the Manchester City player, obviously. No, no, obviously not. He's dead now. He drunk himself to death. Yeah, you've told us that. Well, story, by the time yeah. he was forty, yeah. terrible thing. I know. And um, but he had a he had a lovely little cottage there, which he'd kind of renovated inside a little mm. garden at the back. Yeah. And we go down there, and you know, quite a few people lived around there from the Express. Right. And have these sort of Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon garden parties. Bring and your own box of wine. Uh, exactly. <laughs> I'm not joking. Everybody yeah. turned up with a box of wine with had a plastic handle on the top and a little tap on and the tap, side, yeah. and you just walked around the filling problem, everybody's yeah, glass the all over it was, all the time. You never knew how much you were drinking because you, until no, it was empty, yeah, you didn't exactly. know how much was in it. I mean, you could lift it up. Exactly. But when you started to buy the really big ones, yes. which were too big to lift up, yeah. I mean, you literally had no idea and how much had, of it was in it. They had like consumed. three litres of wine in them, mm. and they went in minutes, you know. Yeah. And the trick in those days is the same as the trick now if you have a dinner party. You serve decent wine yeah. for the first you know, couple of bottles of white, mm. first couple of bottles of red, yeah. and then serve any old rubbish you want from any old box of wine. Yeah. Everybody's taste buds have gone by See, then. that's a terribly and, and cheap way to operate. No, 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 no. I would never have well, done that. What would be the point of ser- serving Chateau Naf du Pape? Chateau Naf du Pape? Chateau, was it? Chateau Naf <laughs> Chateau, yes, right, Chateau, yeah. Neuf, Chateau du Neuf du Pape. Yeah. What would be the Chateau point? Chateau Naf du Pape is yeah, yeah. what you had well, a well, box load of what would fell be off the, the po- back of a lorry. What would be the point of serving that all night well, when people's taste buds have gone into waste? Yeah, but I mean, People just want to get more and more bladder. Yeah, but this is the problem, you know. This mm. is this is the the, the culture mm. from which you have emerged, right? Incredibly over the years that you mm. still were, you were able to walk the earth yeah. because of the amount of booze mm. that used to be drunk, not just by you, mm. but by everybody in those days. The whole right. point about you know nice wine is that you're supposed to savour it. You're not supposed to get completely when, bladderated. When did you ever see anybody in Fleet Street savouring a glass of well, wine? Well, a few people. I yeah, mean, like for rubbish. example, when I used to go to Elvino's, the place mm. we talked about the other day, yes. uh, which has now been sold, I believe, uh, the one is in it? Fleet Street. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, to Davies, I think. Yeah. Um, I always used to get a Petit Chablis when I went there. For a, yeah. I'd have a little sandwich and have a nice glass of Petit Chablis. Oh, or yeah. I'd get a bottle, actually. Right. Um, and between, say, two or three of us, we'd probably have three bottles. Yeah. But it was a very nice, crisp white wine. It wasn't yeah. like just any old plonk. Yeah, sure, yeah. Because yeah. we'd sometimes go to that other place, which is not far away from here. It's no longer there. Stanford's mm. in Stanford Street. Yes. Where they served the most god-awful kind of Australian Sauvignon. Oh, yeah, and yeah. it was only about eight quid a bottle. Yeah, no, And people yeah. would go and drink loads of that and then come back yeah. and wonder why they had a headache all afternoon. Yeah, well, don't worry. They've knocked that down. Now, listen. So we're playing that record there, Fab Bottom Girls, yeah. because of this uh, new scientific discovery. Oh, yeah. If you give somebody a big plate, they eat loads of, they eat big yeah. food. Mm. They eat literally well, big food. I'd have to say one of the things that you bang on about a lot is obesity. One of the reasons why people are eating so much more food now is yeah. because they are so the portions are so much bigger. Yes. And funnily enough, mm. uh, you should mention mm. about big plates. Mm. Um, I've become a big fan of when I go out to restaurants now, yeah. which is not that often. Yeah. Um, I don't order like a massive main course. Right. I'd rather have like a couple of starters. Right. Because quite often Often, one, the main courses are never as good as you think they would be. All right. And second of all, if you have two or three starters, it mm. gives you a much nicer kind of lighter type of, um, you know, enjoyment, right? Really? Yes. Which is what I do. And also, when we were in Mexico recently, yeah. um, my older boy um, was fascinated by this buffet because mm. you could just go literally up and have yeah. whatever you wanted. Yeah. And after a while, we said, you know, we, you know he didn't, it was almost like he had no... Um, uh, filter that said I'm full up now. Yeah, no restriction you know, yeah. to what he was eating. And, you know, because mm. for breakfast you could go and get mm. um, you know some cornflakes followed by uh, you know full English. I'm really breakfast. impressed at cornflakes in Mexico. Might yeah. go there now. Well, I mean it's American, yeah. isn't it? I mean it's a lot of Americans go there. Yeah, I, I suppose mean, so, that's where yeah. they come from. Yeah, uh, they had um, you know they had a big fruit area. You could have that. Mm. You could have toast. You could have eggs. You could have an omelette. Yeah, and he, would, he just kept going and going and going. And I said, you know, well I'll tell you what, if you're going to go and sample mm. all these different foods. Mm. You are now only allowed to put everything on a small plate. Right. And that was the rule that we had. Because otherwise, right. he probably would have eaten himself to death. Yeah, no, you're probably right. You know. It started, in this scientific survey that I'm reading, it yeah. started with um, hotels serving the orange. You know that you get, like, fresh orange? In small glasses. Fresh orange? It, yeah, because when they gave big glasses, people would fill fresh them up. Orange. Fresh orange? You mean orange. juice? Yeah. Oh, right. I thought you were talking about orange, like, you know, the fruit orange. I was trying to... Yeah, orange juice, you fool. Well, you didn't say Um, orange juice. Well, you know what I meant. Um, So you get the small glasses, you put the orange juice in there, right, and then you sip it rather than gulp it down if it's in a a big glass. Right. So from then on, they moved on to smaller plates because they they worked out that when somebody has a big plate... They think it looks incongruous to the eye mm. to have a big plate but only a small amount of food on it. Well, actually, I don't agree because, I mean, a lot of the trendy restaurants, mm. say, for example, in, in London and in New York, yeah. uh, in, in the 80s, started doing you, you know, the big white plate mm. for this kind of, you know, what you might call creation in the middle of it. Yeah. You know, so you'd have a little kind of collection of food in the middle but a very large white plate around it. Yeah. But I get what you mean. I mean, for example... No, but, no, but that's not a buffet. This is the point. Yeah, when yeah. you get a big plate at a buffet, you want to fill the plate yeah. with food yeah. so that there's no well, white. I mean, some of the things that I used to see in, mm. in this buffet scenario in Mexico yeah. was you'd see people coming with literally a plate piled... Mm. 
no exaggeration, about four or five inches high. Oh, yeah. You know, they'd get absolutely. pancakes, they'd lob oh, something on top of I've, that. I've seen it. And I'd think to myself, why are you doing that? You uh, can go exactly. up to the food place and get as many times as yeah. you like. Why are you loading it down with one massive gravy plate? Yeah, it's called Shocking. over-serving, yeah. right? And, and, and it's, it's a self-inflicted uh, way to get fat. Yeah. What you do is you, you do pile food on a big plate because you want to eat it all. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the amazing thing that you say about that, Mike, is that... It's the combination of foods they put on one plate. Yeah. So, for instance, I've seen people, you know, with king prawns on yeah. the same plate as roast beef yeah. and, and Yorkshire pudding yeah. oh, and, totally, and, yeah. and, and all this kind of stuff, yeah. you know what I mean? And they would have things like... Because in, yeah. in Mexico, they would have things like, you know, you could get... I don't know, say, for example, mm. um, some some fish yep. over here on one side. Yep. You could have, you know, some rice over there. Then you'd have potatoes. Yeah. And, but then they would pile all this other stuff on the top. It was just yeah. incredible. Yeah. People it, are very, I, very I, greedy. I, I, and you I, saw, I mean, we've talked before about the amount of food that gets yeah. wasted here. Yes. In those places, mm. the amount of food they must waste must I know, be prodigious. I know. You know? Now, you know, I go to buffets in this country, which you roundly mock oh, me Oh, no, you don't go to buffets. You told me you go to Calvary's. Calvary's. Which well, is not the same, are well, they? Well, Calvary's a buffet. Is it? Of course it is. Eat all, all you can eat. Yeah, absolutely. But, but it's, yeah, I suppose it is a book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so you go and get the old slice of um, turkey, and then you get the slice of ham, right? Yeah. You know, it's all very nice, very lean, all that kind of stuff. Lean ham. Yes, lean ham. But then you can go uh, to the. But like, then you don't get any vegetables with it, do you? Yeah, of course you do, because you're going to serve yourself. You no, see, okay. that's what I'm saying. Right. So you can go to the vegetable. Now, if you were mad, yeah. you know what I mean, and you, and they well, do luckily serve. You're not mad. No, I'm not mad. No, they serve on a big plate. You could literally put on your plate, and I've seen this happen. Yeah. Um, cauliflower cheese. Yes. Well, sometimes you have to have cauliflower cheese. With yeah, the roast. cauliflower cheese. Yeah. Um, peas. Yeah. Carrots. Yeah. Uh, sprouts. Yeah. Boiled potatoes. Yep. Roast potatoes. Yep. Beetroot. Beetroot. Yeah. Well, yeah. Cooked beetroot. Warm beetroot. Uh, well, it, it, never, some I'm people drift off, with, uh... drift off to the salad bar. No, and right. Get that right. Tomatoes. Okay. Yorkshire pudding. What about stuffing? Stuffing. Yeah. Definitely stuffing. So yeah. I've seen some people have two Yorkshire puddings. Yeah. Now, I mean, that is amazing, you know. No. And they've come back, and you're absolutely because right. Because they could go back and get the whole lot once again, yes, couldn't they, could, presumably? Yeah. Could, they could, they could. So is why it... do they put it all on in one go? I don't know, because they, they just see. I think that's... And then, it's and like a sickness, isn't it? It is a sickness. And then the amount of food you see then going back, which then has to be thrown away. I mean, if, if somebody actually weighed the amount of food we throw away each day in this country, mm. it would be a scandal. But there's no it question... It would literally feed countries in yeah. the world that haven't got any food. I mean, there's I mean, no, it there's is a no scandal. question, and I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody mm. in this, is when you're mm. on one of these holidays, yeah. when you're in one of these all-inclusive hotels, you find yourself eating, like, three meals a day. Now, mm. I don't eat three meals a day at all when no, I'm here. I. You know, I, might I haven't have, had a meal today. Yeah, I, don't I mean, have a meal today. Like yesterday I had breakfast, yeah. a little bit of breakfast yes. when I got home, but I didn't have lunch, No, and I had quite a small amount for dinner. No, I agree. Whereas when you're in one of these places, right, yeah. because there's so much on offer... It does kind of genuinely take you kind of a while to get used to the fact that you can just eat all this food. Totally and agree. And you end up eating loads and loads of stuff that you wouldn't otherwise think about. Totally agree. Mm. Listen, I'm giving up um, uh, oil or something because I've read this terrible story about... You're giving that. up oil? Yeah. What okay. do you mean, oil? Um, it, what sort of oil? Uh, uh, palm. Palm oil. Palm oil? It comes from... I had no idea you had a problem with no, palm no, no, oil. No, 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 no. No, this is absolutely true. You know they're knocking down all these forests in Indonesia and places like that. I didn't know that, no. I heard this terrible story about um, a uh, an orangutan. Right. Who was... Uh, was it's another campaign. It is a campaign. That's Tommy the uh, Chimp coming I, along. I, I, no, I, it, it is a campaign. I want to. I want to stop this. They're, they're cutting down all these um, all these forests yeah. in Indonesia and places like that. Yeah. And orangutans are starving. And guess what? An orangutan struggled into a village uh, in Indonesia yeah. and they drowned it because really, yeah, it was starving. But they 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 roped it. You know, they lassoed it, roped it, and drowned it mm. because uh, they thought it was going to attack them. When in well, fact, it was just starving. Yeah, right. It's terrible. I saw a show the other night actually about uh, macaques yeah. Yeah. down in Indonesia. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. You see, you don't care. No, my I, do. Stories, do you? I do. I do. Is I that do. right? No, no, I'm, I'm interested because this one was called Lulu. And, and Lulu. Lulu was the name of the was orangutan. It singing shout as it walked into the village. You see, that's typically you, isn't it? You know, trying to put these things down. It's, now, it's absolutely disgraceful. No, but the, you should be more concerned about macaques because the local uh, people in this particular part of, uh, of Indonesia, right. right, actually eat them. And Ooh, so this yeah, guy went on really a. Nice. Uh, he went on a. Uh, well, especially for the macaques, he went on a kind of mm. wildlife, you know, documentary making mission. Yes. And tried to. Is trying to sort of people are trying to educate the the kids there now not yes. to eat the monkeys. Yes. Because they're really beautiful oh, creatures. God. But they. But they're a sort, of, del- thought of, they're a sort of delicacy. Thought so of people, it's terrible. So people eat them. Thought of it's terrible, honestly, and it breaks your heart really because what's happened is uh, a Same lot of time. By the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of these little infant uh, orangutans are left uh, behind. 
and orangutans and their babies have an incredibly close bond. It breaks everybody's heart. It's it's shocking, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm definitely getting into. So you're giving up palm oil? I'm giving How up palm oil. How's this going to affect your life? Well, how often do you drink palm oil? I don't. You don't drink palm oil. You put it in soap, you idiot. Soap. So I'm going to find out in future. You put palm how many, oil in soap. Yeah. I'm going to find out in future how many products <laughs> so in my house are full soap. of palm oil. I'm going to throw them out. So you're going to give and, up soap. Well, you've got and, hundreds uh, of bars of soap, haven't you? Yeah, I have, yeah. Just Thousands, well, actually. Well, that's probably why. Look at the light! You yeah. know, these poor creatures are dying. Yeah. Because you've stocked up on soap for no, the last well, ten years. No, it's not just me. It's millions of people around the world. But I'm, I'm going to find some other way. Palm oil, it is. Did I say it's palm oil? Palm oil. Palm oil. Yeah, the palm oil trade. Deforestation, that's what it's all about. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to try and, yeah. All right. Well, we'll find out all about that tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. I'll ask you what you found in the house. It's got palm oil in it. I'm going to, I'm telling you. There are other ways of keeping yourself clean. I don't need uh, Indonesia's palm oil to keep me clean. I'll find (laughs) other things. Well, we'll find out what he's going to use to keep himself clean in the next 24 hours. Don't forget to come back tomorrow for another sparkling, as fizzy as a bottle of champagne, podcast from the two mics. Clover was a lovely dog. Knowing my smoking was to blame was like somebody had just put a bullet into my heart. It was a nightmare <laughs> that had come true. What are you laughing at? Why are you doing a voice like that? Oh, because it's the North... She's a Geordie. It's North East. Yeah, I know. My North East why are you doing that? Well, hang on. If a tadpole turns into a frog... Yeah. I can understand that. Yeah. Right, so what does a newt turn into? I don't think a newt turns into anything. Well, it, it must do. A newt can't stay a newt all its life. Why can't it stay a newt? Because it's a pointless existence. Why is it a pointless existence? Because be being a newt has been a nothing. It's nothing, Phil. Well, I mean, you can say that about many things. No, you can't. No, well, you can't. Also, I mean, what's the point of being a hamster? Well, a hamster's a little creature with legs and a, 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 a teeth and a mouth and, and eyes and that kind of stuff. But a newt is just a newt. A newt. A newt is nothing. A newt is a blob. It must turn into something. No, it's not. It's a newt. It's, a, it's an amphibious creature. I don't believe and it. And it just continues to remain a newt. What? D. Z. Stress. Chateau Naf du Pape.